This December 15th, 2022 regular meeting of the Fairfax County School Board will now come to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, a moment of silence, and a performance of the national anthem by the Chantilly High School Chamber Chor Choral under the direction of Evan Ayers. If you would like to review a copy of the agenda and any agenda item that is being discussed tonight, that information may be found at the back of the auditorium or on the website at fcps.edu backslash school board backslash board docs. Tonight's meeting is being broadcast on channel 99 and live stream on the website at fcps.edu backslash tv backslash channel 99. The next order of business is community participation. Speakers must limit their remarks to no more than two minutes in length. At the conclusion of two minutes, the microphone or video will be turned off. School board members will be listening but not responding to individual speakers. The school board will not hear statements involving issues that have been scheduled for public hearings, such as a capital improvement program, budget, and boundaries. Comments targeting, criticizing, or attacking individual students are not permitted during public meetings. Complaints regarding school-based employees should be directed to the appropriate school principal or other school officials. Speakers should refrain from using personally identifiable information in connection with an individual student or school-based employee. Additionally, speakers should be respectful and observe proper decorum in their statements, avoiding profanity, inappropriate gestures, shouting, and comments that run counter to the spirit and the letter of the school division's non-discrimination policy. All statements should be directed to the school board and speakers should remain at the podium until concluding their remarks. As a reminder, speaker substitutions are not permitted. A speaker may not yield their time to another individual before or during their remarks. Shouting and outbursts from the audience will not be tolerated. We are grateful for those who have come to speak to us today and thank you for your cooperation. Our first speaker is Lynn Hotchkiss. Our next speaker is Robert Rigby. I am Vice President for advocacy for the Fairfax County Council PTA. Thank you for the work that you have done on all of these following. Let's continue the dialogue. Half of all lifetime mental illnesses are identified by age 14. Students usually do not receive mental health services they need, and those they do receive, they receive only in school. The increase in students in poverty, English learners, and the impact of the ruling of the Office of Civil Rights of the Federal Education Department make the need even greater. The OCR ruling will impact the workload of special education staff, as their fund sending will cause a pay cut, and this will impact whether those staff remain with us. Please continue to increase the number of mental health and nursing staff also keep as a focus the day-to-day -day services for students with disabilities that are being impacted by stress on staff 
as well as the compensatory services. The impact of the, end of the pandemic on food insecurity and child hunger will last long. It's important to maintain consistency and easy access to nutritious meals. Thank you for bringing back the salad bars. Let's continue the input from the and CCPTA members have also spoken about the effectiveness of the lockdown drills and their impact on children. We appreciate the listening and working together. Let's continue. And to all PTA members, see the Virginia PTA website for registration for our Capital Day webinars that will be in January online and in Richmond. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cameron Ward. Hi, I want to discuss an issue that I think we all should agree on, and that's government transparency. At the October 6th um, school board meeting, Dr. Anderson asked to introduce a, con a controversial resolution. The contents of that resolution are not relevant here, but what is relevant is that she also announced to the board had been collectively working on the resolution for more than a month. Since everyone had already had a chance to weigh in, it was fine to introduce and vote on this resolution the same day. It was not fine because the public had not had a chance to comment. Virginia has an open meeting law for that reason. To quote, the General Assembly ensures the people of the Commonwealth free entry to meetings of public bodies wherein the business of the people is being conducted. The affairs of government are not intended to be conducted in an atmosphere of secrecy, since at all times the public is to be bene the beneficiary of any action taken at any government level. The provisions of this chapter shall be liberally construed to promote an increased awareness by all persons and government activities and afford every opportunity to citizens to witness the operations of government. I'm not a lawyer, but this board secretly meeting electronically via email to discuss and transact business certainly goes against the spirit of the Commonwealth's open meeting law. Holding open school board meetings is just, just to take performative votes with predetermined outcomes and read from speeches that have been pre-approved by lawyers is not right. It's wrong and expensive because parents are then forced to FOIA, FOIA your deliberations and then taxpayers foot the bill. Please, please stop doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dave Hatcher. Excerpts from a recent speech by a college president and national treasurer. To see the problem with American education, reflect on a bar graph that compares the number of students, teachers, and school system staffers since 2000. The number of just staff has grown by a whopping 87%. The growth in the number of students and teachers, around 8%. The graph shows a major change in how we govern ourselves and how we live. Education is fundamental, and it has changed radically and has changed everything else. One way of describing this change, giving a different answer than we have ever known to the question, who owns America's children? Public education is as old as the nation, but only lately has it, begun, has it begun wanting to supplant our family and control parents. The political success of Governor Yunkin and his girl Friday rock star Elizabeth Schultz has largely dominated right now. But we do have children being turned against their country and ours by large-scale revisions of history, claiming ours is a time of irredeemable injustice evidence schools statues and streets being named being renamed all around us 1984 lives cultural marxism who owns the child then the choice is between the parents who raise the child or the school systems more likely than a parent to want to engage in a social engineering asset in wanting to revolutionize society this political back this political battle simmers with dishonesty Criticizing public education translates to criticizing teachers, but the numbers show that the system works in the opposite way, detriment of teachers and for the bureaucrats. 
Teachers unions claim that they defend teachers and children. At most, that's only half true, being that these unions are defending school systems, systems that have grown by... Thank you. Our next speaker is Holly Hazard. Thank you, Madam Chairman and the members of the board. I should have played the lottery because I've got two speaking spots today. I don't know that that's ever happened. Uh, I am representing for public education. Uh, I want to take a moment at the end of this year to reflect on the amazing progress that Fairfax County Public Schools has made this year. First, the board found and hired one of the most inspiring, skilled, creative, and brilliant leaders that I have ever met in Dr. Reed. Already, we've witnessed a remarkable cultural transformation. She started her tenure by listening and meeting with parents from each of the 29 high schools. She's cast a wide net for input on an ambitious strategic plan called attention to the appalling statistics on te teen drug overdoses and is seeking ways to curb them. She's addressed the particular needs of military families and has identified serious gaps in pre-public, uh, pre-K pre education. Second, our schools are recognized nationwide for their excellence. For example, Justice High School was selected as the National Demonstration School at the National Association of uh, Black Educators. Four, Fairfax County Public Schools have been recognized as Purple Star Schools. Third, on a large scale assessment such as the SOLs, uh, SATs, ACTs, Fairfax County Public Schools students are performing well above state, national, and global averages. Fourth, we have a cacophony of programs for students interested in almost any endeavor, including auto collision lab, whatever that is, veterinary science programs, health sciences, information technology classes, HVAC classes, and of course, band, dance, as we saw here, chorus, arts, and even our own Fairfax County Public Schools bakery. Fifth, this board has led our, the, our division out of one of the most challenging periods in educational history. With no roadmap, the board has also stood up against unprecedented ignorance, hate, and a misunderstanding of our LBGTQ plus children, and with fairness and respect, stood strong against book bans, shaming, and ostracizing our vulnerable youth. I would say, like to say happy holidays to all, and here's to our continued success in 2023. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephanie Lundquist Aurora. Good evening. Your FLE advisory committee has proposed illogical changes to the FCPS sex ed curriculum. Parents are overwhelmingly disagreeing with the committee. With very few exceptions, they are telling you that they don't want their fourth grade sons learning about nocturnal emissions, wet dreams, in front of girls, or their fourth grade daughters learning about their menstrual cycles in front of boys. They do not want their fifth graders to suffer the embarrassment of learning about intercourse in a co-ed environment. They do not believe that complex gender identity issues are the school's jurisdiction and they object to the school board exchanging the word girls and boys with assigned male or female at birth. But you, you've already heard this ad nauseum in the last two regular school board meetings and in emails and in surveys. You at least need to be transparent with your constituents about when you intend to vote on this very sensitive issue. I've recently sent two emails asking when you intend to vote, one to Ms. Cohen and the other to Ms. Eismore Heiser. Thank you, Ms. Cohen, for responding earlier today. I do wish your answer were more informative. You simply told me that the vote had not been scheduled. So why not? What's the holdup? When will you schedule it? When will you vote? Why won't you tell us? I also sent unanswered emails on December 1st to Ms. Keys Kamara, Ms. Sizemore Heiser, and Ms. Cohen. FCPS Pride, an organization that the board officially endorses on its website, sent a libelous email to its membership earlier that day. In it, the sender accused several FCPS parents, including me, of being anti-LGBTQ. I am telling you now and have stated many times publicly that this is simply not the case. You should not endorse organizations that libelously villainize parents to try to frighten others away from vocalizing very justifiable viewpoints, like objections to co-ed restrooms and co-ed FLE. Please vote no on the proposed changes to the FLE curriculum. Work harder to be more transparent and do not continue to support the bullying of parents with whom you disagree. Also, I see most of you aren't wearing masks anymore. Please do the right thing and expunge my son's existing political mask suspensions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shelley Arnoldi. Hello again. 
Um, my name is Shelley Arnoldi. I'm a mother of four high schoolers. Um, the FCPS's 124-page Student Rights and Responsibilities document defines hate speech as any form of expression intended to humiliate or incite hatred. Um, in addition, the document provides disciplinary action to be taken for using slurs or hate speech. During the last school board meeting, a parent referred to you all as groomers because you're introducing sexual materials to young children. And Ms. Marin pointed out that slurs were not acceptable. Are any of you familiar with the Constitution or the First Amendment? Um, hate speech and slurs may not be nice ways to communicate, but every American has the right to say what they want within the law. You cannot use the student rights and responsibilities to make the law or break the law, and you cannot restrict the speech of parents. It's we, the parents, who elected you and trust you to take care of the thing most precious to us, our children. The Ford, Soros, and Kellogg Foundations had research firms discover how to make radical agendas for moderate audiences. Study participants turned a dial up and down to record their reactions to different phrases and words. The study showed that repeating the word equity, which a few, few listeners could define but which sounded innocent enough, worked. Fairfax County Schools uses equity everywhere in your budget, strategic planning, and other program documents, which means one of two things. None of you actually knows what you're doing, or you're all trying to hide radical agendas. In 2014, uh, uh, there was a school sport participation during adolescence and mental health early, in early adulthood study done, and it was posted on the National Library of Medicine. The results stated that involvement in school sport during adolescence was statistically significant predictor of lower depression symptoms, lower perceived stress, higher self-rated mental health in young adulthood. FCPS does not funny, fund any athletic programs for middle schools and funds a fraction of the high school sports. Please start spending money on sports and after school activities and stop funding counseling and special, for special needs. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is George Becerra. Our next speaker is Zoe Anagnus. Our next speaker is Karen Ramsey. I want to thank the board members and Dr. Reed for giving me the opportunity to address you this evening. I've worked for the county for 20 years as a special education teacher for 16 and as an instructional coach for four. The special education teacher shortage began before the pandemic because the workload is impossible. Special education teachers are expected to be experts in specialized instruction and procedural knowledge. Advocates and lawyers are highly trained and well paid. They will be able to find fault with any IEP because teachers are not lawyers. Special education teachers often lose planning time, preparing for and hosting IEP and eligibility meetings, doing KTA testing and report writing and numerous other procedural requirements in addition to planning for instruction. The pandemic only increased the workload with temporary learning plans, constant updates to IEPs to add virtual and face-to-face -face hours and documenting the need for progress of students requiring recovery services. At times, special education teachers even now or instructional assistants are asked to substitute for general education teachers. The teacher shortage increased greatly during the 2021 school year and continues today. Because of the shortage, I started this school year with 18 students at two different grade levels and across six classrooms. My school wasn't assigned anyone from central office to support. My school is still short two special education teachers. A teacher resident was hired in October and supports one of those grade levels. However, I'm still responsible for all the procedural requirements. Board members, I plead for your help. Any pending necessary action due to the recent civil rights agreement cannot be left to just special education teachers and school teams. Central office staff and any other available administrator staff must help all school teams for review IEPs and correct whatever mistakes were made during the pandemic. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aaron St. Germain. I'm here today to speak about the proposed changes to the family life education curriculum. In particular, the terms assigned male and assigned female at birth are not only inaccurate, they're confusing and nonsensical to most children. How, I wondered, could FCPS recommend such radical language? What experts support this and why? To get these answers, I looked at the sources FCPS has cited in their justification. 
But what I found was not a peer-reviewed article or a recommendation from developmental psychologists or educators, but rather an opinion piece written by advocacy organizations. So I decided to learn more about them and what they stand for. And here's what I found. The first organization that FCPS looks toward to educate our children is Advocates for Youth. This organization has their own education standards, uh, sex education standards called The Future of Sex Ed, which, has the pleasure, which I had the pleasure of reviewing. Here are some highlights. Starting in third grade, eight to nine-year-olds sh should learn about sexual feelings and masturbation, as well as the role of hormone blockers on young people who identify as transgender. Starting in grade six, it's anal sex, which is necessary because in grades nine to 10, the children learn to describe effective ways to communicate desires as they relate to pleasure and sexual behavior. The second organization that FCPS looks toward to educate our children is called Sex Ed Honestly, they describe themselves as a national organization that promotes unfettered access to sex education for young people. And believe me, they mean unfettered. Answer has a website for teens full of information, including an article titled Anal Sex, From Stigma and Myths to Facts, that does our kids a favor by recommending lubricant for anal sex. The third organization that you look toward to educate our children is called SECUS. Um, sexual sex ed for social change. In February 2022, they had a webinar called The P Word, Porn Literacy and Sex Education, where the moderator said, porn can be good if sex ed is good. They said, we have to be aware of the beautiful ways pornography was invented to be a fantastical, wildly unrealistic tool. It's not about making kids stop watching porn, it's about being literate. I don't know about you, but it sounds to me like she's advocating for porn and not our kids. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stacy Langton. Our next speaker is Harry Jackson. <clears throat> uh, good evening, school board. That was a very interesting talk from the previous speaker. Hopefully you might do some review of your FLE program looking that you're not, see, considering you're not using industry best standards. That's just one example. I'm just thinking about the other ones, like the books that you have in the library, the other ones promoting prostitution, looking at pornography. But that just uh, beside the point. Um, uh, other things, just think about, like, how good of a job have you been doing the last two years when you have SAT scores during your tenure drop by 27 points while the rest of the Virginia goes up by 14 points? I think a lot of parents have had it that you're not really sticking up, that you are degrading the educational qual education, the quality of education within Fairfax County, and I think they're going to, they're going to, that's going to be seen next to November's election. Uh, marginalized parent groups using the R word in the presence of a student advocate. Come on, not only that, but in your personal c capacity, it's been a rough week, hasn't? Where you actually will omit information going before a judge, and then having then sticking CPS on a parent that's actually trying to get. Uh, wait, 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 hold on a second, Mr. Jackson. I have to stop you. Um, under Section C on page 59 of the Governance Manual, the school board welcomes. This is a limited public forum, and we welcome. Um, Does that count against my time? Your time is paused. It was paused at one minute. Please reset at one minute, please. This is a limited public forum. Mr. Foster, on page 59 of the governance manual, it says that the school board welcomes community members by comments at its regular business meetings and public hearings on school board deliberations, school-related issues, or topics related below, such as the uh, capital improvement plan. Um, does this relate to what capital you read? It's not a capital improvement plan. Excuse me, Mr. Jackson. Does this relate to what you read in the governance manual, Mr. Foster? It does not. Please keep your comments related to um, public hearing, the school board deliberations, school so related I issues, or particular topics. So, I w so there wasn't a violation. You just paused me because it wasn't a violation. It, it was in violation, Mr. Jackson. So I'm asking you to please keep your topics related to school uh. board deliberations, school related issues, or particular topics as listed in the governance manual. Thank you. Okay. Well, I only had one more minute to go regarding that, but that was interesting. Um, wow, also notice that you've has had a decrease in student attendance, but yet you've had to increase ESSER funding to increase funding per student. That went up like $8 million. And that, where do those ESSER fundings go? Oh, let's talk about another highlight. You had an increase in human trafficking throughout, throughout, the, uh, throughout FCPS, where you actually had ESSER funding to, fund, to find, what, about 700 minors that you didn't even use that funding for. I think when parents, when they find out about this, they'll be shocked, they'll be outraged, and I think that this is going to change during the election in November next year. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, it's, you should be having also the camera on the face of parents, and hopefully you have new school board members that will actually engage with the community, and not where they have to have advertisements on the back of their shirt. Anyway, 
Uh, Harry Jackson, I'll be coming for your seats. Thank you. That was our final speaker. Thank you. Agenda item 4.02, strategic plan update. I call on Dr. Reed for the strategic plan update. Good evening, um, and it's my pleasure this evening to provide a strategic planning update. Laura, are you my, all right, let's go to the next slide. Um, yesterday, we also had a work session with our consultants, and I appreciate um, the planning that the team did so that we're ready for a retreat upcoming for, um, for you as a board, because I know that's been a request. So we're working very carefully to be thoughtful about uh, the retreat content and options we have. Let's go to, oh, thank you, Laura. Um, we wanna let you know that as we closed out, we actually had over 100,000 responses from our students, which is an all-time high, and I really wanna thank our staff across the division who supported this work and each and every one of our students who took the time um, to respond to this. So there were um, 45,670 in the grades three to six and close to 57,000 in our secondary students, grades seven to 12. Um, we're really excited uh, to share those results. They'll be available in 2023, actually, which is right around the corner. So it's hard to say that we're headed to 2023, but we're really excited to look at that data. Laura? Um, I also want to share that principal-led focus groups finished last Friday, and we really, again, principals and staff have just had a lot on their plates, and I just uh, really appreciate uh, each of their attention to detail. Um, we yielded, honestly, over 4,500 responses, and our principals actually, I think, learned some really interesting uh, things from our students and we're excited and they're going to be included in our student voice report which the board will have an opportunity to re review the data as will each of our planning teams our core team alignment teams um, and our faith teams all will have a chance to review this data the planning meetings to date we've already had seven convenings across five teams and we review as a cabinet every monday with both mutu fabai and uh, Kenneth Jones, so we are on it. Um, if you want to acknowledge people, I really want to thank our team, uh, particularly Marcy Neal and Dustin Wright, who are our project co-champions, Alicia Martinez, our project manager, uh, Dr. Nardis King, Dr. Grace Taylor, Dr. Francis Ivey, Dr. Iona Spikes, who are all co-champions of teams, George Pacera, who is a co-champion of our core planning team, Dr. Sloan Presidio, um, Megan Roman, both co-champions of our instructional teams, Lisa Hall, um, and Douglas Tyson, our co-champions of our faith team, and Noel Komenko, a co-champion of the family team, along with Renee LaHuffman Jackson. So just a really broad group. There are many folks on the leadership team that have taken leadership roles in this work, and I'm proud of each of them and what they've done. Also a thanks uh, for Betris Huffman, Gotham Sethi, and Liddy Haruda for their data work. It's been an all hands on deck project and I couldn't be prouder. Um, here are the community forums as an update for our community. I wanna make sure that everyone's aware that we've got a lot of opportunities ahead for communities to join you as board members, as you host um, and participate uh, magisterial visits as well as at large opportunities for the community to provide feedback. And lastly, um, I do want to say that we added three additional virtual community meetings and they'll take place in mid to late March. Uh, lastly, stay connected. Um, I really want to thank um, Helen Lloyd and our Office of Communications and Community Relations who are working really hard um, to uh, craft a landing page for our strategic plan updates and we should have the data and information all in one place, so we're excited um, that that work continues. So tune in to Thursday evening board meetings and school board strategic work sessions uh, to hear updates as well as attend a forum, and that is the update this evening. I'd Thank be happy you very to answer questions. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Reed, and um, please thank your staff and our team for their incredible hard work and effort they put in. It is much appreciated and it's seen. Um, I will take questions from my colleagues. I will start with uh, Ms. Mayor and then Ms. Tolan. Thank you, Dr. Reed. This is such an exciting endeavor, the process and the ultimate outcome, which will then continue the process. Can you just explain a little bit more about the expectation for those community meetings that you put up for for the new year? You seem to have, you and your team have led so much community outreach already. How are those ones different? Um, should people attend that have been to previous meetings? What is sort of the ideal uh, type of input or experience you want to try and put out there? Thank you, Ms. Marin. That's a great question. Uh, we have, I have, as you know, um, been involved in a number of community meetings, right? 28 of them most recently in the evenings. However, this is, these are community meetings specifically focused on our strategic planning work. So if community members want to be a part of that large community voice and collaborative spirit uh, that's going to set our 2030 uh, North Star, I think this is a great opportunity to come out or be a participant in a virtual um, whichever you know feels best, but to to show up and have a voice in this process. I know that um, the facilitators for those uh, community conversations are going to be presenting some data as well. It won't be as deep as the full day commitment work, but there will be an overview of the data and the process and an opportunity to provide input that's directly and specifically focused on the strategic plan. You bet. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Thank you. Um, I don't really have a question, I'm more of a comment, I guess. Um, I, you know, we've had the presentation at the work session the other day and then your presentation this evening, and I, I just want to just step back for a second. And, uh, you know, in the past month, over 100,000 students have given input to this plan. Um, the principals that I talked to then that ran their focus groups, you know, were excited about the things that their students talked about. And, and hundreds of community members um, from FCPS instructional leaders, 70% of them school-based, which I was really excited about. And then general community members and families gave input. The consultants have a huge job ahead of them over the next six weeks or so, five weeks, to compile all of that survey data, all of the information from all of the meetings, and then turn it all around and come back to us at the, at the end of January, February, um, so that we can begin our next set of meetings. So that's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking forward to that. I was very happy to participate as a board member after being invited um, in one of the strategic planning teams. Lent my teaching and instructional expertise to the instructional focus team. Um, thanks to Sloan and our Dr. Presidio and Megan Roman for running that. And that team has already spent over 16 hours of work, like the core planning team also. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting all this additional data and analysis next February so we can continue that work. So really just a huge thank you to you, Dr. Reed, and the planning team and our consultants for taking us through this process. It's a really exciting time for the division. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Tolan, and thank you to the board members, too, for your participation. I know that matters a great deal to the staff and the community, so thank you. Ms. Corbett-Sanders. I actually am going to echo much of what my colleague uh, Ms. Tolan mentioned about just the sheer amount of data and uh, actually look forward to the reports that will come out in January. I also wanted to um, reassure the public on the, um, the transparent nature of what's going on and your responsiveness because you listened when you heard about the disparate, you know, that they're not disparate, but that the distributed nature of all of the data being right. in different places, and you responded with, okay, we're gonna have a centralized place for it, and everybody has access to it, and um, we're gonna make sure that people have access not only to the data and uh, the uh, planning documents, but also into the conversations. And uh, if you could clarify, I believe there's a significant number of community members involved, uh, both in each one of our planning teams, as well as our faith-based leaders. Do you have a number of the total? Well, <clears throat> I know we had uh, close, I think right around 140 members at instructional core planning team. The alignment team, we had, I think, close to 40 members. Same with the faith team. Um, so it, I mean, there are hundreds of voices. And 
remember, we're going to be sending also a survey to families and a survey to all staff, which those come out after the first of the year. So literally, there will be tens of thousands of voices of that will data be informing points. this. Yeah. So we have 100,000 students. We have hundreds of people participating in each of these teams. And we have uh, both in-person and virtual opportunities for the community to participate. And it's my understanding, uh, Chair Seismer Heiser, that we've already set a retreat date for the first part of February, um, which all of our retreats are also public and transparent to anybody who wants to come. And so I very much um, appreciate your work in uh, responding to questions and willingness to adjust to ensure that we continue to uh, that process of continuous improvement. So thank you, and I look forward to the data you're going to share with us, not only from the students, but the principals and the uh, planning teams. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Um, seeing other board members, I see uh, Ms. Togby wanted to speak, so I'll give you a turn. Thank you. Um, I had a couple questions. So, well, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Very excited for all the feedback from principals, teachers, students, and all that. Um, I had a question about the community forums. So will board members be present at them, and will it be like a similar approach to the community conversations in the sense where like it'll be a large push for not just community members, but faculty and students? So that's a great question, Ms. Togby. I think um, there'd be a little different. The community conversations were much less structured. Really, I was there to hear from the community. I think the community conversations around the strategic plan will be a little more structured because I think that there's a real high interest in us sharing at least briefly some of the data that we're looking at um, and then allowing for feedback from the community, staff, students, anyone in that uh, magisterial district that wants to attend. I think one of the real benefits both of the community conversations and of this process isn't so much the didactic interaction between division staff and community or division staff and students or so forth, but it's the ability for the community to hear one another. And I think it's a powerful community development um, experience when we have a chance to hear one another and not just hear from the division, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a a powerful opportunity for us to experience um, a space together. Um, and it is my understanding that uh, school board members will be attending. Okay, good to know. And then on the note of like hearing that kind of push for students at the same time, I think it'd be really interesting to see if we'd maybe tried contacting leadership organization or SGAs at every individual school for these community forums in a sense to push, because I know if you get your weekly student emails that tell you what's going on in your right. community, if I read community forum about strategic planning, that wouldn't really ring a bell for me. Um, but if we really push that through maybe leadership classes and get them to advertise it on the school specific social medias, maybe that'll be a great push for students to show up. I think that's a great idea. Um, and I think Ms. Neal just captured it. Yeah, thanks Ms. Togby. Thank you. I'll just briefly say I want to say thank you to, to you, to your, our consultants and your team for the incredible hard work. I know when we, the board started this process back at our first retreat in August talking about um, looking at our strategic plan and, and we um, jointly decided to re-engage with the community and re-engage to see really what we needed to do um, to help create a preferred vision and future going forward. And we, um, in September at our retreat, really sat down and um, went over the schedule and the purpose of each of the meetings. So it's been really wonderful to see what was presented to us as mm -hmm. here's what we're gonna do in, in this school year, which seems so ambitious, come to light. And I know um, it, from the outside, it looks like it just happened, but from, you know, I know your team has worked very, very hard, um, and I really appreciate the chance to um, be a part of the planning teams for the board to be part of the planning teams, as well as for the board to be able to have its own um, planning right. team moment to dive into the data and together with our community, listening to their um, thoughts with our um, staff, help guide us on best practices with strategic planning, um, and the board coming together to really think about what is our preferred future collectively as a board, with our staff, with our community, and what do we all want to see for our children right. going forward. So I'm really excited about the continued process, um, so thank you for all that. Um, 
So with that, I will also turn to you, Dr. Reed, for an academic matters update. Thank you, <laughs> Madam Chair. And I, I want to say that many hands make light work. Uh, so it's the team that has done the lift, the heavy lift with the strategic plan. But I couldn't be prouder, and I also want to say that we did say we'd do it, and having 102,000 plus responses is, um, I think, pretty impressive. That's going to be statistically significant. <laughs> so anyhow, I am presenting this evening for Academic Matters uh, several data points around our ESSER funding and how we've utilized that to address uh, learning loss, and I want to thank ahead of time uh, Dr. Presidio and Noel Clemenko for putting together and Mark Greenfelter this uh, data set. So, Laura, if we could go to the next slide, thank you. I want to make sure that we understand that, and there is no one in this room or the division, this commonwealth or country that won't say that the pandemic created some academic challenges for us. Our students did not, in general, perform as well, and we absolutely acknowledge that. I will say, however, that as we work to improve um, the academic prowess of our Fairfax County uh, public school students, we have been uh, utilizing our ESSER dollars to support primarily our reading and mathematics work. And the graph I have up here does share that the rate of our academic recovery is outpacing the Commonwealth as a whole. Our reading performance in writ large is nearly back to pre-pandemic levels after one year. And we know this is gonna be a multi-year journey, but we feel like after the first year, we've made significant progress. And again, that's hats off to our incredibly hardworking educators in every role within schools, our teachers, instructional assistants, our um, food and nutrition folks who make sure our health and nutrition is where it ought to be and our custodial and maintenance having our facilities clean so we can keep as many kids in school as often as possible, our drivers who make sure things happen. This is an all hands on deck division wide effort um, but it's paying off. Our math performance is progressing towards a pre-pandemic baseline and if we continue at this rate, we should be back where we need to be within the purview of our ESSER dollar window. Next slide, please, Laura. Thank you. <clears throat> These are a number of strategies that um, we have employed. And I think this is a fairly clear chart. Um, notable is the summer school programming. In 2021, uh, Fairfax ambitiously served 34,000 students which was a tremendous uh, gain in enrollment uh, to provide supports for students prior to returning to the classrooms in the fall of 2021. And this past summer, 32,000 students were served. And again, these were strong supports. I know upon my arrival in the division, I had an opportunity to tour a number of our summer sites, and there was a significant amount of work going on. On the left side of this, I want to be able to share that of the approximately $102.8 million that's been allocated directly for student academic and wellness support, that these are some of the strategies um, that have been utilized in terms of the ESSER funding. Our hourly pay, instructional materials, and professional development have been significant. Uh, this week, I had the opportunity to meet with um, Noel Clemenko, Colleen Eddy, and Amy, our math, Hunter, Amy Hunter, and we had about an hour of the most um, lively math discussion I've had in quite a little while. And there are really ambitious plans for our, not just recovery in mathematics, but just a renewal and an excitement about what we're doing with mathematics in the division. And I'm looking forward to sharing that with you, as well as a theory of action and data dashboard for our indicators and our movement towards eighth grade algebra minimally for all students, not the ceiling, but a floor for all of our students. So we're thrilled with the work um, and the funding is enabling us to really put into place, I think, some practices that likely will uh, do us in good stead far into the future. Last slide, please, Laura. And here are our reading and math identifications, and this is our current impact analysis. I want the board to know that we're not looking at just annual data, we are looking at real-time data in our instructional services department. And what's really exciting this year is that our regional assistant superintendents and our regional administrative staff are working directly with principals 
and teachers on um, the student work and achievement school by school, classroom by classroom. And I think that that's yielding uh, results that you see with decreases in our highest needs assessment um, data and strong increases um, in our work around, uh, again, recovering in both reading and mathematics. So I believe that was the last slide. And big thanks to, again, Instructional Services, Dr. Presidio, Mark Greenfelter, Noel Clemenko, the team. Um, pretty exciting work. So there you have it, Academic Matters. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Reed, for that information. Um, I will take some questions from my board members. Ms. Marin. Yes, Dr. Reed, hello again. So I'm wondering how to um, kind of combine a few reflections from this evening. You know, I think um, we hear parts of people's experience. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's not, and people want more. And then we see your database um, presentation here showing us that students are, are doing quite well. And I, th well, they're getting, right. they're doing well. It's yeah. not, um, a situation that some might paint as, you know, um, as what it, they paint it as. And I'm just wondering how, you know, when I listen to our, many of our um, speakers tonight in collective bargaining, the things that they're asking for are things that are not in our control as, as an education system. They're societal things, they're revenue structures for taxes. They're how community and society values education. They're colleges of ed. So I'm wondering how to take the momentum and the positivity and the data that you're presenting into the upcoming strategic planning conversations that you just presented on as an opportunity to educate the community with data about where our students are. And not to say that everything's perfect, but to say that it's also perhaps not awful, of things that are within our control. Um, I, I just see a lot of connections here, and um, that's very encouraging data. Now I know, I mean, with my own kids, I know they don't quite fit in there just yet, but like, I want us to be positive in building public education up and not constantly talking about all the things that are wrong, so many of which are not in our control as a school division that doesn't even control the revenue generators. You know, people are asking, why can't we fund staff raises with $3 billion? That's not, we don't even control that money. So anyway, I just ask that you think about how to educate the community and bring them along in the excitement you've generated with the data that shows that there is momentum and change happening that's good for kids. Thank you, Ms. Marin, and I, I think what's really important, and I know the board, the reason I'm making these reports is because you wanna know, are the things you're investing in making a difference? Um, we've talked about ROI, the return on investment, the impact that you want measured, our program evaluation that you're not just curious about but expect, and what I'm showing you this evening is real-time data that says what we are implementing is making a difference in the right direction. I am not here to tell you tonight we're there. I'm here to say that the data is moving in the correct direction, and I think that it was wise on the part of our leadership uh, well before I got here to realize that the ESSER dollars, we need to have them last through several years because the pandemic was not a one and done, one year issue, and we're not gonna recover in one and done. So we need to be patient, which is, not always our highest virtue, myself included. We need to be patient and understand that the several years we've, of trauma we've all lived through may take us several years to um, climb out of, but if we do it in a thoughtful way, we'll do it in a less stressful, healthier, and more sustainable way. And I'm proud of all of our educators and the work they're doing, and I know you are too. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Thank you. So I've, I've seen this data a, a couple different times, a couple different ways, and one thing that strikes me is that it just doesn't, it doesn't speak to the work that's being done by educators in the classroom. Can you talk a little bit about how our educators are using these ESSER funds, whether it's with instructional materials, what have you, what happens when they have a child who is behind? How are they helping do close, how are they producing the results in the classroom that lead to a presentation in our board meeting? 
Wow, <clears throat> well that's a big question, isn't it? So let me share an example from our math conversation we had this week. I heard about a lot about our what's called AVMR training, which is work around um, math instruction, pedagogical instruction. And we've had over a thousand teachers already sign up, and this was a, here's an option, right, that we're able to use ESSER dollars. And well, I think that was a year ago and another 1,200 this year, am I correct in that? Um, actually, you've got a microphone. You wanna talk about that for a minute, please, to respond to Mr. Frisch's, do you feel comfortable with that? Sure, okay. so um, Dr. Reed was starting to talk about AVMR, which is an example of something that a lot of our elementary schools have invested in. Um, it really gives um, our elementary teachers not just what to do with kids, but really builds their content knowledge so that they can um, apply what they learn in AVMR to help a student who's struggling, but they also are deepening their own understanding of mathematics so that they can apply that in while they're teaching their whole class instruction. A lot of times we find that elementary teachers don't have as much content knowledge about math um, as some of our, um, you know, obviously I was a math teacher for middle or high school. so. By having those ESSER dollars and by being able to provide that training and those opportunities, because that kind of training is not just you go and you learn, but you go and then you try it and you get feedback. Um, and so it's a little bit more intensive and ESSER dollars is allowing us to do that with more teachers, provide more um, training and build the efficacy of more teachers. Um, so then what is happening actually in the classroom is really more intentional. They're able to understand where a student's deficit is and target in more closely because they understand the progression of learning. Does that, does that oh, help? Oh yeah. I mean, and, and the reason I'm asking that question is because we're stuck on this idea that we're going towards this goal of getting to the pre-pandemic benchmark. And if this is working right now, Imagine what we'll be able to do when we reach that pandemic benchmark and begin working on the gaps that preceded the pandemic, something that we've wanted to do for a long, long time. And so when I see every school having its ESSER uh, spending and improvement plans on the websites, these examples of how it's being used in the classroom speak to exactly what's happening in our schools right. and how that money's being spent for that purpose. Um, so I think it would be good for us to remember, like, this, this is an equity lens on the classroom. Um, and, and what that means is it's giving educators the tools they need to offer enhanced, differentiated instruction right. so that the kid who's further behind gets the help they need and the kid who is excelling is getting even more tools to excel even right. further. That's correct, Mr. Frisch. I, I, our dream is that as we complete this ESSER round in the next couple of years that we're gonna see a closing of the gaps and a soaring of a ceiling. Because I think so often we've just compressed and created a standard level. And I think if we move to the space where we're able to be more personalized, utilize our multi-tiered systems of support effectively, provide that early literacy foundation, there's no telling what our Fairfax students are able to do. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Thank, oops. Thank you for this information. Um, just kind of going, pivoting a little bit because this is also a question that I get asked quite a bit and this is a good space for you to talk about this. Um, you've talked about the ESSER funds, um, the ones that are targeted towards the academic endeavors to help to um, close the gaps and to deal with the learning loss. I would love for you to be able to also connect the dots to talk about how the investments and the social emotional side have impacted the academic gains that we're seeing here in this recovery process. So great question, Dr. Anderson, thank you. And I, I think, you know, one of the things Fairfax County has prided itself in is attention to the whole child, right? There's not just that academic side, but the social emotional um, and the fine and performing arts, all of those play a role in a really, mm -hmm amazingly uh, a mountaintop education experience. So I know that our instructional services division has utilized ESSER dollars to create a more centralized approach to social emotional learning. The new advisories, the middle school recess opportunity, of course those aren't ESSER funded, but those have been, I think, uh, tremendous in their approach in terms of providing time for students to 
um, develop those social emotional skills. I know we've had a number of materials crafted to support instruction in the classroom around social emotional learning. Um, having had the opportunity, in fact, you and I were at Glasgow watching uh, and experiencing recess where students were actually talking to each other, right? And it could also be a little less uh, screen time that's helping our students kind of take it down a notch while we're in school. Um, but I, the ESSER approach uh, to social emotional learning, I think, has been really a strong supporter of our academic work. Students learn better when they feel safe, right? Intellectually, emotionally, physically. Um, Nicole, or Noel, sorry. Noel, do you have anything you want to add on the SEL piece? Yeah, I don't have as much to add um, on that piece. I will say that that could be um, a future academic matters. I think it could be a really interesting to take a deeper dive because I don't think we spend as much time talking about that. Fair enough. That makes sense because yeah. I think people are also looking for those connections. You bet. Um, because they all lead to the goals that we have, which is high academic performance for all of our students. Also, the other piece that continues to happen, I know we all know that these uh, plans live on the school's websites. Can you also articulate, because I know there are other ways that um, these plans and how ESSER funds are being utilized to help students are being articulated to parents at our schools? So the ESSER plans this year, I really, um, this last spring, they were aligned and worked on really much more centralized and we talk a lot about what's tight and what's loose in the county, but I think the ESSER planning was something that really became much tighter. Uh, the structure was tighter while the options were loose. Uh, but those I know are being shared at curriculum nights. Um, they are on websites and they are being reviewed. Most importantly, I know each of you have done data conversations with schools within your regions. Um, or if you're an at-large member, you know, and, uh, data talks that are more division-wide. Um, but I know the ESSER dollars are part of that and the ESSER plans are part of those conversations. So I appreciate board members' attention to ESSER plans as well. They've been integrated actually into our school plans. Okay. Not, they're not separate, which I think has been a key to their success. And I raise this because very often I, I don't think our community is as mindful that these um, plans are being shared and communicated right. in other ways. It's not just you have to go to the website and, and right. to dig into all of that data because we know how easy sometimes it is to navigate the FCPS website. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that people were aware that the principals are taking good care to communicate this right. information out in, um, in other ways. My last question, you shared data that was division wide, um, which is very helpful. In your um, disaggregation of it, did you find that there were pockets of students or pockets of schools that were not meeting, that were not making the gains? Not or also. not making as, as, can you put that slide back up? I think it was the first one, please. Not, right, we have, I just wanna know what you thought. I don't wanna put words in your mouth. So what I will say, uh, Dr. Anderson, is that not all schools have the same rate of acceleration. Right. Can you speak a little bit in terms of who those schools are, what kind of students there are, and what does that mean? I think, you know what's interesting, and I'm gonna have to go back to my, let me take a moment here to remember, because I sat in on one of the data conversations. Oh, I sat in on the data conversation around early literacy. And I was actually a little surprised, and Noel, you have my permission to lean in and correct me if I don't get this right, um, thoughtfully. Um, but if I recall, what was interesting to me is in, let's use reading as an example, K through six, it actually, our third through sixth graders were um, recovering at a higher rate than our younger students, our kindergarten through second. Um, is that correct, Becky? You, you recall the same thing. And I actually, in my mind, intuitively, I thought that our youngest learners would tend to recover most quickly um, and that our intermediate learners would have had, a, you know, they would still be accelerating, but it would have been at slightly um, not quite as quick a rate. But in fact, that wasn't the case in reading. So I would say our youngest learners, um, and you can have all kinds of theories, um, a theory we had is we, some of our youngest learners had to learn school, 
um, as well, right? Like mm -hmm. if they weren't in a classroom in kindergarten and maybe um, mixed in first grade, then as they came into second, there were some other sort of, we had to get the SEL or sort of um, attention, uh, developmental attention skills and so forth um, going so that we could focus on academic skills. So I would say for reading our intermediate students are making growth and maybe they'll surge through the winter, right? When we look at our midpoint. I would also say that the students who, um, in some cases, well actually, let me pause for a minute. Becky, you've been shaking your hand. Let's um, ask Becky Vainig, who is a, our lead RAS. I think she has some thoughts about our students, perhaps where we struggled more um, than not. Yeah, well I think Because there were some surprises, honestly, so. You, you've highlighted some great points, Dr. Reed. I mean, the iReady definitely showed us, as Dr. Reed outlined, that our upper grade students um, accelerated more in the year than our K-1-2s. And just wanted to share the other pieces. When we do look, Dr. Anderson, at our data, we look at it two ways. We look at who's met our benchmarks, right, whether we're talking a past proficient, past advanced on an SOL, or whether we're talking with iReady the 40th percentile. So we look at how many students are at those benchmarks, but we also look at growth because our schools that may still be lower with their achievement, but are showing accelerated growth, that means what they're doing is working and we wanna honor and celebrate that. Um, the other thing that we've done across regions is look at those schools that are high achievement, high growth, or maybe their achievement's not there, but they're very high with their growth. And then just going back and looking at their SIP, um, their school improvement plans, and talking through their strategies and actions to unearth, well, what were the high leverage strategies that you employed that you then account for those results? Because those are the things we would want to replicate across schools and connect schools who maybe didn't have those rapid gains so that they can benchmark. And, and so let me, if I can paraphrase, we had this grid, right? Four quadrants, and the four quadrants um, had schools that were low performing, high acceleration, low performing, low acceleration, high performing, high acceleration, right? Four, and every school was plotted on that, and we went through those by region, and we know that if it's a low performing school with low acceleration, we're implementing more resources right now in a school that is not performing and not accelerating. So our regional assistant superintendents, it's not just we're handing out the same amount of money to all schools and the same amount of time and resources from our instructional services. We're actually looking at every single school on the grid and saying, here is where we're going to focus right now. And what I'm really excited about it is visiting classrooms where we have perhaps low performance and high acceleration that are really making moves and making sure that we're understanding what they're doing so we can replicate that strategy in other schools. And in some cases, it's also honestly just experience of staff, right? Because we have to remember, we've started the year, and that goes to some of the comments we heard earlier this evening, we've started the year in some cases with substitutes in classrooms. And I wanna say last year, even with the progress we've made, I wanna remind us where we were last year. We were still out for four to seven days when people were sick, right? Like, so the intermittent attendance last year was not a fabulously perfect academic year. So to make the progress we're making, we're actually, um, we're excited. So uh, more to come on that, Dr. Anderson. I, I'm very interested in seeing that quadrant that you just described. I you might but be. I, <laughs> data begets more data. Right. But I, I do want to hone in a little bit. If you found that in your exploration that staffing was mm -hmm. one of the barriers, what does that mean to you in the short term and in the long term? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. It's probably um, one of the things we're talking about right now is a hiring pool right now designated for schools that maybe most specifically are gonna need our most experienced uh, folks. So we're taking those data points, we're doing that root cause analysis to say, well, why do we see that? What could we do? And then our teams, pretty much putting it on the line and saying this is what we need to do. 
and we're doing it a lot earlier. We're like, we're not waiting till May to bring you a report. Like, people are looking at this right now. Well, I cannot wait to see that. And my final question is regarding um, the role of parents in the recovery. Definitely, pr um, probably more at the elementary level than at the secondary. Parents are wanting to know, how can I help my child? Because if the school has realized that my child has these gaps and deficiencies, and they're using tutors, they're doing all kinds of things in the building, I, I don't, the parents who are speaking with me are not feeling as if they're getting enough communication in terms of how they can support those endeavors at home. How can we make sure that we are articulating what those tests, not just what the tests are, but the results and then the accompanied strategies that parents can do themselves at home to help the acceleration? So this morning, actually, I was out at Forest Glen, Lisa, is that the name of the school I was at? Forest Glen? Glen Forest, sorry, darn it. Glen Forest Elementary School, um, visiting the parent liaison, um, parent literacy uh, program. And it was really uh, fabulous to see parents coming into the schools and learning more about what is happening, you know, in terms of classroom instruction for our youngest learners. I will say that I think we could do more to provide parents that experience. I know after our last work session, we're talking about how do we put, like, uh, kindergarten, grade one, grade two, if not the pacing calendars specifically online, but at least expectations topically, uh, so parents can feel like they have a sense of are we kind of on point. And I think one of the ideas we are looking at is within those grade level spans, maybe linking to resources that parents might consider. Um, but we also want to kind of just take a break here for two weeks <laughs> and kind of put things down so that we can come back really uh, rested, re-energized staff and students and families um, and just be excited for the start back up in January of 23. But more to come for parent resources. Okay, thank you. You bet. Thank you. Ms. Corbett Sanders. Thank you, Dr. Reed. You often speak about innovation. And I actually think uh, similar to what Mr. Frisch offered, uh, the beauty of the ESSER funds is that it has allowed us to innovate in ways that we may not have done in the past. And so what would be very helpful is perhaps by the end of this year, having a look back and saying, okay, of these things that we've done, these are the ones we want to stay, we want to keep in our uh, best practices. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there are a few different ones. Um, I, we, we've had our school improvement plans for years, and actually parents are engaged in the development of a school improvement plan at each one of our sites. And so, or they're supposed to. Um, I've actually sat on school improvement planning committees as a parent. And so knowing that that's an important part of the process and knowing that we have uh, published our ESSER funds, uh, our ESSER plans, and that as you spoke to tonight, we are doing a quarterly review by school on where we're at in that. And that allows us to triage problems and also share best practices when they're working. So would it be possible to kind of get a a look back from you at some point of these are best practices that we built into the system, these are things that we know worked, these are things that didn't work and we shouldn't do anymore? It's possible if you ask me to do it, I have, of course we will get it done, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, not over the holiday. Secondly. Oh, you um, meant academic year, not calendar year. Correct. Good, thank you. Um, <laughs> The next piece is we know that we have a lot of data. Um, we've seen a lot of the data in the strategic planning process. We saw a lot of the data here. We've seen the data on um, our performance uh, with the NAEB as well as actually right. national and internationally right. normed larger data sets. So um, we know that the VGA is coming out soon. Right. Will you be using the VGA data to inform the ESSER work? Yes. You will. 
Um, would it be possible to have a briefing on how we're going to use that VGA data? We, yes, I'm getting the nod that it would absolutely be possible. Okay. So we will get that to you. That would be wonderful. I am obviously particularly interested in the schools in my district. Okay. Um, but I believe that it's something that all of my colleagues would share. You bet. An interest in. And then finally, the last piece is regarding um, the ESSER funds. We know that they're coming to an end. But one large portion of the ESSER funds that you actually didn't have here um, was the gift of time for our special education teachers. Um, knowing that they have more on their plates, we couldn't actually give them time, but we did give them a stipend. Um, and I would love to see, as you go forward in developing your budget, uh, your proposed budget, that you take that into account. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. keyes Gamara. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate this conversation tonight. I know previously in a work session we talked a little bit about um, where ESSER funds, how ESSER funds had been used, and at that time I asked for, you know, just a short summary that parents could easily access to understand. I felt like today's presentation was a step in that direction. Um, but I also agree with some of my colleagues who talked about, you know, and I've always said this, that this is an opportunity as you refer to it. Um, there's a lot of good stuff going on in our schools. The question is, do people know it? And when they don't know it, they describe it in a way that is less accurate uh, than is really beneficial to the community to really moving together toward a particular goal. So I took a quick look on our website, just ESSER funds, learning loss, et cetera, and I really didn't find anything. Okay. It, you know, it was really quick, so if I missed it, please forgive me. Um, but if I, you know, as a parent, I would, if I'm looking at this huge investment, I'd want to be able to look online and, and easily hear, first of all, what is your perspective? with respect to how we're going about making this investment, and then the kind of information yeah. that you provided today. Um, my colleague sitting next to me talked a lot about those things that we can't control. This is one of those things that I think we can. Yep. And it's truly um, to everyone's benefit, right? I just, yep. I could see parents breathing a sigh of relief. I don't know what the viewership of the school board is, I'm guessing it's a lot less than, yeah. <laughs> than um, how many families we have in, in, in FCPS. And so I, I really want to make sure that we make that information accessible, right? Um, and you know, there's areas of growth, there's areas where we're doing really well. We, we need to have that, in my opinion, right. um, more easily available. Um, so, um, the other thing I, you know, I've listened to some of our uh, comments tonight and, you know, there can be a negative approach or a negative view of equity. Um, but I know that we uh, have been working on an equity policy. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see that um, addressed. We've had several meetings, public meetings regarding this. But it really is the idea of how we've talked about it as a board is guiding these decisions. And I think the more that we can communicate that so that people actually know what we're talking about so that we don't have to combat what it isn't mm -hmm. um, is helpful. Um, a part of that also uh, was mentioned by my colleague, Dr. Anderson, with respect to SEL. Uh, I'd like to have that on there. And lastly, if I can just squeeze in, you know, a parent's corner, right, mm. in that information. Mm -hmm. uh, this is how you can participate. This is how you can help. So thank you. I tried to make it succinct. I yeah, use, no, I usually and I, don't make the bell ring, but anyway. I appreciate that, Ms. keyes Gamara, And I think um, we have opportunities on the website, um, and I'll have some time the next couple weeks. So I think we'll have a chance to take a look at that. I also want to say that what I was talking about with the quadrant and schools that, you know, are accelerating at different rates, I think the 
where we think about equity as something beyond a policy, right? When we think about it as our work, we know that we're gonna have to support schools differently. We need to provide what each school in each context and each and every student need so that we get not just to where we were before the pandemic, because that wasn't good enough. That wasn't working for all of our students prior to the pandemic, right? What we want is an education that provides what each and every child needs to achieve their potential that they would like and their family would like. And I think that's also part of the evolution of our chief equity officer and the department Dr. King is leading. We've talked a lot in the last several weeks about it's not just around uh, responses to incidents, it's about the education that each and every student has and has the opportunity to have. I don't know, Dr. King, if you want to talk a little about kind of really the focus on what happens educationally and the attainment opportunities that are available for each and every student. It's not just response you know, to incidents. So Dr. King, do you want to take a minute and just kind of talk about, I'm excited about the evolution as we shift to more action that's integrated into the work of the division. So Dr. King. Thank you, I'm Dr. Reed. You know, our team has had the last couple of days um, through a retreat with Dr. Williams um, around how we can push our way into the academic side and not just be responsive to the cultural, right? Cultural is important um, and we are going to continue to um, be thought partners with our principals when they have issues um, around culture. But if we want equity to be at the center of all we say and do, we have to see equity in all that we say and do in Fairfax County Public Schools. And so we are working as a team to reimagine what our equity office can look like. You know, I always tell Dr. Reed that um, Mark Greenfelder did a really good job building OSS, right? And they gave schools the support that they need. We want to see our equity work permeate through the district in that same kind of way um, so that each department is keeping equity at the forefront of what we do to support our students in Fairfax County. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. King. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, just picking up a little bit on Dr. Anderson's um, line of questions, I, I would say going forward where my concerns continue to be is as a large division, um, it's often been said that we're a, a tale of two counties. And so I do think based on the national um, data that has right. come out about the impact of the pandemic, we know that students in poverty um, had the greatest losses and we haven't necessarily seen the same gains. Um, and, and Dr. Anderson even n made a comment about what families can do. We know families with right. means um, mitigated it during the pandemic and continue to mitigate right. post-pandemic. So um, I, it would be helpful to kind of have staff really look at this and, and um, again, after the break, well <laughs> after the break, I am all about the, yeah. everyone yeah. needs to, rest and recharge. Um, the other thing I will say, if the, that chart um, can come back up uh, that showed uh, the three years in comparison to Virginia, um, you know I'm kind of a stickler about making sure that our PowerPoint slides speak for themselves. And so uh, that slide, the very bottom says three year comparison and it says 2019 to 2022. So that's a little confusing for people if they don't understand oh, that really what we're test. talking about is yeah. school year 20, school year 21, school year 22, or are we talking about school year 19 to 20, and then which was pre-pandemic. Um, so I, I think and each of the bars should be labeled because okay. again, it's just, it's kind of counting on people to understand how to read it. But okay. so I was Fair point. wanting to really um, see how we can continue to improve the way we communicate out and people understand what's there. Um, and then I think it would be very interesting, again, looking at the, the Delta. When you look at uh, where we were against Virginia pre-pandemic bar, there was about a three percentage point mm -hmm. differential. And now when you look at this past year, yep. um, it's a six percentage point. So. Right to what you're saying is, yes, we're making our gains faster. Right. Um, however, again, we are the largest and highest performing right. district in Virginia. So sometimes 
comparing ourselves against the whole state isn't always right. um, where we're gonna want to compare ourselves. So right. I would say maybe looking at uh, maybe the 10 largest school divisions with similar poverty rates. Again, I know a lot of our larger school divisions in the country tend to also be um, set in areas with higher poverty. So that would be my other suggestion for meaningful an analysis. Fair point, um, Ms. McLaughlin. Yeah, it's not compare ourselves to the rest of the Commonwealth, but okay, got it. We're into the playoffs, right? Final four group. <laughs> All right, we're on it. Thank you. Yep, you bet. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Reed, and, and thank you to your team for the academic matters and, and folks on the ESSER funds and learning loss and, and really addressing some of the issues that um, we hear and, and our right. families and our community wants to know. And I just think, um, one, if you could share this presentations with the board after, after that would be great. But I, I really think having an academic matters section on the website, even there where people can oh. go back and look, or yeah, maybe if it's searched by ESSER or searched by whatever the topic, you know, I know we talk about EL students. I think that might be also um, a beneficial thing so people can kind of track what we're talking about. So yep. yes, ma'am. Thank you it. so much. I appreciate right. it. Um, and with that, I will move on to agenda item 4.04, .04, student representative matters, and I call on Ms. Togby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone, and happy Thursday, and happy winter break eve. I can't believe that this is gonna be the last time they're all, that we are all together before the end of 2022, and wow, what a year it has been. I've only joined you all in this my, in my capacity since early fall, but I've, I'd like to think that I've been fighting to make strides for student voice long before then, alongside my peers, and in the midst of it all, time and time again, I have to say that I have witnessed the voices of teachers, administrators, bus drivers, and more kind of fade into the background almost. Um, the working conditions that they're in are also the conditions that students are learning in and th that I am learning in. And for far too long, I've watched those teachers, counselors, like my trusted adults, all of whom are trust, all of whom are staff members, stretch themselves far too thin. I've left my school at hours pretty late because of various activities, and I will still see them in their classrooms, whether it's grading, creating lesson plans, or tweaking certain things. And they've already been at school from eight to three already. Um, Nora, the student earlier, really said it best when she said that it's important that we stress that we have, haven't really seen a lot of teachers say in the post-COVID era that we're living in, and because they're stretched so thin, the more and more responses that responsibilities that are being handed to them, that's they can't handle it. That's it's it's too much, and employees deserve to be heard at the decision-making table, and I really can't stress that enough. If, if I was asked to go visit all of my teachers from my freshman year, there would only be one teacher that I could visit at my school, and that's, that by itself says a lot. Education, recruitment, and retention programs are necessary for this exact reason, but please correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm correct, it would cost more money to go out and recruit people when we're very strong on saying that we support our employees, but we're failing them in that aspect when they will move be for better situations, scenarios. Where's the support for their mental health? Where's the support when teachers post Amazon wish lists in groups out into the community? Changing the way that we select and train and compensate our employees is a big part of the system that needs changing and it's also necessary in educating all the kids in our division. Teaching is one of the most important professions, but the current system that's designed discourages our best and our brightest from entering the profession, which in turn deprives our kids. So I ask, I'm honestly kind of begging you guys to be completely honest, if you look at the learning and teaching conditions of our students and teachers when reflecting on testing data and you draw conclusions like, what can we do to increase these test scores? What, why are we looking at high numbers of staff members leaving the county? Think about the working experiences of our teachers and like the learning, student, learning experiences of our students. When a teacher is given an unmanageable class size with students that can be loud and disruptive, that's class time that's being lost. When a teacher is burnt out because 
of countless reasons, and they choose to sacrifice their leave time to take care of themselves for just that day, a class period could be behind, and that could ruin a unit. When we're not getting the best lessons or instruction, it's because teachers aren't being given the guidance and support that they need. It's not just about the compensation of teachers, and you know that, but it's the respect, and honestly, more specifically, the lack of respect, and not just from students, from members of leadership, even at their own schools. And they need an opportunity to actually be heard. I wanna say that what's best for my teachers, my admin, and my admin assistants, my counselors, bus drivers, custodians, all staff is what I wanna see. And it's also, I wanna see what's best for my peers too. And as always, thank you so much for your time and I'm looking forward to a great start together in 2023. Thank you, Ms. Togby, as always, for your wise words. I will call um, agenda item 4.05, Superintendent Matters, and I call on Dr. Reed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <coughs> excuse me, and thank you, uh, Ms. Togby, um, for your comments. Um, as we're getting close to winter break, <coughs> I just want to take a brief moment um, to share a couple events that I had the opportunity to attend recently. Um, December 2nd, um, had the opportunity to attend the women's basketball game at West Springfield High School and have a fabulous moment because they were retiring Kara Lawson's jersey. And that was, a, I think, kind of a historic event. She was a West Springfield High School graduate who went on to play for Pat Summit at the University of Tennessee and as a college baller who grew up watching women's basketball kind of come to center stage, Pat Summit was somebody that, I think I have every book she ever wrote, and to have someone who played for um, Coach Summit, um, who then went on to earn two Olympic gold medals um, and become an ESPN an analyst, <coughs> and is currently the head women's coach at Duke University. Uh, it was really kind of a fun moment for me. I had a chance to send a picture that we took to a former student athlete that I coached who had played at Duke, uh, Lee Morgan, who actually held the three-point shooting record for a number of years, so we had kind of a, a fun reconnect moment. Although I don't know if it was a great moment because I realized Lee is uh, in her 40s now that I was coach here, so I know, okay, I won't go down that road. The other thing is I had a chance to watch our Oakton girls basketball team square off against South Lakes. Um, or actually, I think they played um, Yorktown, so maybe I've got the wrong notes here. They played Yorktown, and oh my goodness, I will also say that at halftime, the Oakton dance team is amazing. Um, it was kind of a moment I was sharing with several staff that I thought maybe I could do a cameo appearance. It's kind of a little get ready for winter break. Um, I was talked out of it. I got no traction at all on that. Um, so I did have an opportunity to see the Herndon High School and Middle School choirs um, at the Reston Town Center under the direction of Dana Van Slyke and Susie Kraft. Fabulous. It was a little windy and cold, but uh, the voices were amazing. It was fabulous. Also want to <clears throat> recognize Justice High School, honored by our National Black School Educators Alliance Conference, and also our very own Dr. Nardis King, who's the president of that national association. So appreciate that, Dr. King. Um, and that was a fabulous conference. Uh, just want to say that we've got staff all over doing amazing work. Uh, Fairfax County Parks is offering camps during winter break. So for any community members watching, I think it's an opportunity. They'll be focused on cooking, dancing, athletics, engineering, nature, and more, hopefully math. Um, and the Flores Elementary student Lego team won the regional championship, and I haven't had a chance to get out and see what they uh, created, but I'm sure it was exciting. And then one of the highlights of my experience since last we met was Dr. Presidio and I had an opportunity to host an ESSER 3 community conversation um, this week. Uh, we had a number of community members join us in person and online and had a fabulous conversation. And that is my report this evening, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed. And remind me not to schedule a board staff basketball game anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think it might be better than a board staff <laughs> dance team. So I'll move on to agenda item 4.06, capital improvement plan, and I'll call on Dr. Reed for the introduction.
I will be introducing for our capital plan, Mr. Chuck Fant. Well, actually, I'll introduce Marty Smith to introduce the team to present that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Dr. Reed, and good evening, Madam Chair and board. Uh, tonight, we are excited to bring forth uh, the capital improvement program, and we're very excited to uh, share it with you in a different way than we've shared in the past. We know that we have the presentation this evening. We have a work session scheduled for January 10th. And uh, in the meantime, in between uh, the presentation and the work session, we'll have an opportunity to have had uh, conversations with board members uh, regarding the CIP, and we will be building those conversations uh, into the presentation for the 10th. We've got lots of great things uh, planned for the 10th. And before I turn the uh, evening over to our interim uh, assistant superintendent for facilities and transportation services, Mr. Chuck Fanshaw, I do want to take this moment to uh, first of all, introduce him to the community. It will be his first presentation before the board. He's no stranger to the community. He's a member of our, of our very own community uh, and has uh, very quickly made a name for himself uh, within uh, Fairfax County and with our friends on the Planning Commission and in, with, within Fairfax County government. And I do want to thank him for his uh, dedication and service to Fairfax County Public Schools. He has brought uh, an immense amount of talent uh, to the position. He has brought a unique uh, vision and perspective to the role, and uh, I am grateful uh, to have him uh, within this uh, particular position. And so with that, no pressure, Mr. Fanshaw, but uh, I will uh, turn the presentation over to you this evening. Uh, and again, uh, we will have a high-level presentation uh, and know that we will have a full work session to discuss uh, many different aspects uh, of the CIP with the school board. Thanks, Marty. No pressure. Um, <laughs> and if we could pull the presentation up. Thank you. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, good evening. A capital improvement program is a planning and fiscal management tool used to coordinate the location, timing and funding of projects over five years. The program includes an annual view of current student membership and facilities data to identify projects such as new construction, capacity enhancements that include modular and or additions, and renovations along with potential site acquisitions. Newly, newly identified needs are included in the estimated schedule of capital projects for the next five years, and the capital cash flow tracks the funding allocation for these projects. Over the past five years, the CIP has constantly evolved to improve communication and transparency through additional maps and tables, membership and facility capacity data, information on the asset management program and environmental sustainability at FCPS, along with new resources and an appendix with information on each facility. We continue to present this information through the CIP and on the facilities and membership dashboards. Next slide, please. This year includes some new sections in the CIP. The asset management and environmental sustainability information have been pulled from the resources section to create two standalone sections on these important topics. The resources section has been updated to reflect the adjustments to the 2021 man magisterial districts, references to the ongoing process to update the capital project community engagement process are also noted, and upda updates to the process continue. The purpose of this communication process is to enhance and improve the community engagement for capital projects. Next slide, please. Information on recently completed capital projects can be found in the proposed CIP beginning on page 50. Completed projects include additions at West Potomac High School and Madison High School. Next slide. And renovations at Washington Mill Elementary, Hughes Middle, and Herndon and Oakton High Schools. Next slide, please. The certified students, the certified September student membership is used to produce a five-year projection that adjusts to shifts in membership trends as they occur. The COVID-19 pandemic has had an impact on the overall FCPS membership. FCPS experienced a decline in certified September membership 
of approximately 8,900 students from school year 1920 to school year 22-23. I'll also note that total membership has increased by approximately 1,000 students from September 2022 to November 2022. The proposed CIP includes a five-year membership projection, program capacity utilization, potential solutions to consider for each school with a capacity deficit, and a five-year capital construction cash flow. Next slide, please. Funding, for, funding sources for the CIP include the general obligation bond as voted on in the biannual school bond referendum, operating funds, and from the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors for infrastructure management and proffers. Bond funding is used for major capital projects such as renovations, additions, new school construction, modular, modular buildings, and site acquisition. The annual limit for general obligation bond funding has increased over time. The most recent increase is an annual allocation of $205 million per year, and the upcoming increase to $230 million per year. We thank Fairfax County and Board of Supervisors for their continued partnership, which results in increased funding to support FCPS capital projects. As a result of price escalation in the construction industry, we continue to monitor these costs as they relate to FCPS capital projects. School construction projects approved in the November 2021 school bond referendum are included in this CIP. Transfers from the FCPS operating fund of $13.5 million are used for routine and major maintenance and $2.7 million for overcrowding. An annual transfer from the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors of $13.1 million for infrastructure management has been increased to 15.6 million in fiscal 2023. Per offers or voluntary conditions agreed upon between Fairfax County land and land development applicants. Per offers can address both on-site and off-site impacts and once accepted they become a part of the zoning regulations applicable to the property unless subsequently changed by a development plan or new zoning amendment. Proffers often include cash contributions which are allocated to projects related to increasing the capacity of schools impacted by development. FCPS received just over $4 million in fiscal 22 from residential development in Fairfax County that had an impact on the capacity of facilities. Next slide, please. This slide is to summarize capital projects identified in the capital construction cash flow. The FY24 to 28 cash flow identifies the current and anticipated funding and schedule for the following projects. New school construction of three elementary schools and one high school, three new and or repurposed school facilities, the construction of an addition at Justice High School, relocation of five modular buildings, renovation of the schools remaining in the queue, acquisition of land for one new high school. More detail on project cost and schedule are on page 46 and 47 of the proposed CIP. Next slide, please. The total five-year requirement is approximately $1.4 billion. Approximately $470 million is funded by bonds and, and the remainder is unfunded. The 10-year requirement is approximately $2 billion with approximately $514 million funded by bonds and the remainder unfunded. Information on this slide can be found on page 46 of the proposed CIP. Next slide, please. The total five-year requirement for infrastructure replacement, and these are major uh, buildings components like air handlers, uh, chillers, boilers, etc., is approximately $380 million, of which $150 million is funded by the county transfer major maintenance and approximately $230 million are unfunded. Information on this slide can be found on page 200 of the proposed CIP in the new asset management section. Next slide, please. 
Get to Green is the environmental stewardship program for FCPS and supports student-driven environmental stewardship programs in FCPS. Currently, there are 148 FCPS eco schools registered with the National Wildlife Federation Eco Schools USA program. 54 schools achieve awards through the Eco Schools USA program, including the only schools nationwide with permanent green flag status, which are Katherine Johnson Middle School, Centerville Elementary School, and Flint Hill Elementary School. The FCPS Energy Conservation Program has allowed the division to reduce energy expenditures by approximately $69 million and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 39%. Solar power purchase agreements are continuing to progress with two schools awarded a power purchase agreement contract in 2022. More solar projects are expected in 2023 and will result in solar installations at no initial cost to the division. FCPS follows the JET recommendations starting with the 2021 bond projects to incorporate net zero design elements with a goal of achieving net zero energy facilities. As we evaluate the full cost impacts, we ensure design choices to make us net zero ready. FCPS received its first electric school buses in 2021 as part of the JET commitment to provide carbon neutral student transportation by 2035 with eight electric buses in operation, we anticipate an additional 20 arriving in 2023. Information on this slide can be found on pages 232 to 240 of the proposed CIP. Next slide, please. Uh, today, we are presenting the proposed CIP as new business. This proposed CIP is scheduled to be discussed in much greater detail at the school board work session on January 10th. A public hearing is scheduled for the proposed CIP on January 12th, and school board action is scheduled for February 9th. The board will have an opportunity to provide feedback and staff will incorporate changes to the CIP along with the concurred amendments from school board action. And that's the end of my presentation. And before questions, I do also uh, want to note that Ms. Jessica Gillis is uh, with us this evening. She's our Executive Director for Facilities Planning. And we do want to thank uh, Ms. Gillis and her team, uh, specifically uh, Brian Schuster, for their work on the CIP. Uh, it's a monumental task at the beginning of the year uh, to work to not only do projections for our budgets, but to also produce the CIP. And the office does uh, magnificent work. And, uh, if there are questions that we're unable to answer this evening, again, we have the work session on the 10th, and Ms. Gillis will be available to answer questions as well. Thank you. And just to, I'll just piggyback on that and remind you, we do have a work session scheduled for January 10th on this. Uh, um, so I'll go ahead and take questions from my colleagues now. But if you don't get your questions answered, we have plenty of time on January 10th. So I'll start with Ms. keys Gamara. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Fanshawe. We, I think we spent some time together last night on the schools committee and um, we fielded a number of questions, um, which kind of goes with uh, some of what my comments are today. Um, going into this work session, I, I realized in, as a result of other meetings as well as last night, that the average person, even those that are involved in government, have no idea how we're making these decisions. Um, and I also realize that when, when I look at how we talk about bonds, um, we certainly um, may not have laid out as well as we can, or perhaps this is an area of growth and opportunity, as Dr. Reed would refer, um, to perhaps uh, help the community understand that. I would love to see a, a graph of the life of a bond right? Um, so perhaps it would help if we had some charts for this upcoming work session uh, to understand, um, first of all, you know, we may even, we may identify that something is needed, right? But then how long does it take to actually get a bond, the, the request for the bond set up? What's that process look like? Then once we get that bond, um, how long does it take 
for, to identify and get those funds set up so that you know people in the community start to see some improvements we are you know our, our bus fleet is one of the largest in the nation and I think uh, the maintenance of our buildings um, rivals that but I don't think that we um, have communicated it as clearly as we could in as simple a way as we can such as a graph or um, you know a flow chart etc and so I'm just going to offer that as something that might actually help our discussion on January 10th because we were um, we had the opportunity to be with um, uh, the Planning Commission and a number of other folks and a lot of the questions they were asking I'm going but hey we're doing this obviously these are our more some of our citizens that are more informed and, and involved in the governmental process and they didn't know so perhaps this is an area where we can uh, help to clarify that um, and and we just go in these meetings and say pull up the website all right thank you <laughs> thank you very much Mr. Fanshawe, did you want to respond? I think it's more commentary, but I wanted to give you that opportunity if you wanted to say anything. Okay, no, thank you, and I, I appreciate the uh, that simplicity is is much easier to follow, um, and I think we have opportunities to present things simpler. Thank Less you. is more. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Yes, thank you. Um, always very interested to see our capital improvement program um, I'm happy to say that uh, you know we've got a renovation undergoing at Cooper Middle and uh, renovations about to start at Drainsville Elementary and Herndon Elementary School so that's all very good for Drainsville um, I will be asking a lot of questions um, we've already been talking um, in depth uh, across the division for um, Kent Gardens Elementary School one of our most crowded elementary schools and um, I'm also working with our capital planning and development committee with Ms. Uh, Karen Keys Gamara and FPAC, um, and, and we'll be asking for some changes to the plans so that they're highlighted in there. Um, so I'm looking forward to we have, um, for the public too. We do have um, two, what we call two by two conversations for the board coming up in the beginning of January. So we'll all have opportunities as board members to. Be, have some very specific comments um, to our facility staff about the CIP. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I am hoping that we can also make a kind of simple for our public what we're doing, the work that we're doing around the renovation queue um, over the next months. And, um, you know, and maybe talk a little bit about how the public will be engaged with that. I don't know, Mr. Fanshaw, if you have any comments you'd like to make about that. Yes, thanks. Um, we are in the initial phases of kicking off uh, to develop the criteria for the next queue, uh, and we'll be having discussions as we roll that out, um, and then uh, including a uh, engagement plan so that we make sure we hear um, from the community as well. So that that's in its initial stages. Uh, it will follow after our CIP work is done, but it's integral to it's really the integral to next year's CIP because it, it's uh, all part of the process. Right, exactly. Um, yes, so those of us with McLean High School will be very interested to see how that, you know, the building um, analysis pans out. Um, also, you know, living uh, in James, right next to Tyson's, um, Mr. Frisch and I have done lots of work with constituents on Tyson's development. So um, I know the CIP is supposed to be a five-year look at planning and to really help with immediate needs around um, staffing and you know what we're doing in the short term. Can you tell us, like, you, there's a little bit of long-term stuff. You mentioned a few 10-year things. Um, where can we really see the longer range work and planning and looking at development in Tyson's and other areas of the county and how we're going to have to plan longer term um, with our um, enrollment numbers, et cetera. So I, I, I'll take a little bit of that. I think that we have opportunities every year as we work with our colleagues at the county. We know that we have 
uh, an annual uh, presentation to our board that focuses on growth and development uh, within the overall county so that we can make better decisions uh, about what our needs might be for students and schools. Uh, and so we will certainly continue to engage with our, uh, our colleagues at the county as we think about growth and as we think about where those residential units will be coming on, um, on board and how we can uh, best think about all of the options available to us in the CIP to meet the needs of our students. And uh, as we've talked about, uh, those options range from anywhere from looking at individual space within buildings uh, and reassessing uh, what those instructional spaces look like, um, all the way to trailers, modulars, uh, and then uh, uh, new construction renovations and, and boundary adjustments. Okay. Um, I've also asked already for some um, you know, we have some community members that have done some analysis or just looking at our um, development happening in the Tysons area, looking at the numbers of students that are projected and how that compares to our numbers in the CIP. So I hope we'll be having further discussions on that. Um, and my last comment is on the environmental side. I know a couple of us were a little surprised to find out that um, the Dunloring plans were not net zero. So could you talk a little bit about that and what the planning is around net zero? So I can, sorry, we have, I think I'd like to also use time in the work session to go into this in a little more detail. And I think what I would want to lay out is um, what it takes to get to net zero and then some of the choices we're making along our way to make it easier for us to get there. Um, and I'd actually, we have to do a, more research so I could give, a, give you a good answer on this as well. Okay, thanks. I look forward to the work session. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and I would also add that as Mr. Fanshawe shared earlier, we're looking at um, net zero and then thinking about what net zero ready also looks like and we'll be able to speak to that uh, in the work session as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Yeah, happy to just give a little preview of some questions um, coming up for the work session. But a big one, certainly, um, I know you know it's coming, but uh, Stella and I had last year a follow on um, that in this CIP that we would have a proposed location for Western High School. Um, I know there's been a lot on the plate, but I'm hopeful that in the work session you will be able to give us an update. I am, I'll confess, disappointed to see it on a 10-year timeline um, when it was bonded over 10 years ago um, already. So I just, you know, I think I would say those of us who are really counting on trying to get um, some of those schools, some of our high schools, some capacity relief are really counting on that Western High School. So would, we'll be excited to learn more about it. Um, also glad to follow Ms. Tolan in adding to your net zero conversation, the Willow Springs renovation. Um, just wondering about what um, green components are happening there. Um, and conversations too as we go through um, your two cents on potentially changing the way that we design um, some of our school renovations. So either going to a more standardized process where there's three types you choose from and this is what works best for this site or um, whatever, but to, to maybe better streamline a little bit some of the, especially the space utilization on some of our um, renovations. So uh, again, appreciate all the hard work. I know this is like we're throwing you into the lion's den. Um, right away, welcome to it, but, um, but we appreciate everything that you've been doing and look forward to the work session. Thanks, I look forward to the discussion as well. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Thank you, Mr. Fanshawe for stepping in and being our acting assistant superintendent. Um, I've really appreciated your enthusiasm and professionalism, so. Um, one thing I, I do want to share about Net Zero is, um, you know, you inherited this directive, 
but I look at Arlington and they have net zero schools. I was actually in Durham, North Carolina this summer and had hoped to put together a little slideshow for staff because it was so inspiring what the government is doing there. They're trying to be by 2030 either carbon neutral um, or on completely renewable energy and my good friend happens to work there and I got to see the installation of a geothermal system. The only downside was that it happened to be for um, dealing with juvenile um, detention, but at the same time, look at the, the best facilities for the students that most in need. And the geothermal was not outrageously, I mean, I think it was under a million dollars. And I know we have one, I would like to know the reasons why we can't, or maybe just, let's just figure out how to do it. Um, I also would love to hear more about the bond. Um, and Dr. Reed, I will come back to that in a second about the school bond because I think that's one of those things that the community doesn't know enough about. And we have some great advocates on our bond committee and our community members who step up to do that advocacy. But I know also there was some work that was gonna happen with a better communication strategy for our, uh, the bond projects that, that was mentioned. So this is again just one of those opportunities to keep informing the public because all this stuff doesn't happen with any of that three billion dollars. This is all from the bond that comes from the votes that only happen every so many years for so many schools. So um, Dr. Reed, I would love to know either tonight or perhaps um, for our work session, I recall that you did some amazing work with bond, bond work in your previous position. I feel like there was a number like a billion dollars in there was that right? It was a lot bigger than our 200 million bond. So I would love to hear what your experience is, how you go about maximizing the bonds, um, because we, it seems like we could use some fresh ideas. So perhaps instead of putting you on the spot tonight, if you could share that at the work session, I'd really love that information. Um, and lastly, someone recently asked me what I would do if I could do anything in education. What would I do? It would be to make smaller classes. Smaller classes, smaller schools. If we could do that, if we could plan for that, what does that look like in this document? Um, I'd love to see us really think big and get more towards what we know is better for kids and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Frisch. Thank you. Um, also just previewing some topics for the coming conversation. Um, I'll be interested to hear more about the planning around the Q plan as well. The plan for the plan around the Q plan. Um, also, the subject of net zero, uh, the draft CIP does indicate that we have a commitment to energy carbon neutrality by 2040. We can't get there if we don't build net zero schools. Um, and it uses an interesting word by our commitment to zero waste. It uses the word aspiration. Um, the board did not vote for an aspiration. The board voted for a commitment to zero waste by 2030. So one thing I'll note before um, yielding my time is that the board's commitment to net zero facilities by renovation project and new construction was not um, something done lightly. It was a directive of the board. So if we're not capable of doing that, the steps towards that are not to be taken without coming back to the board and having that conversation. Um, and I, for one, um, would you know look forward to hearing more about how we're going to make Dunloring uh, a net zero school. I know we have other facilities that are close to it, um, and it would be great if we started making some progress there um, as well. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Corbett Sanders. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will be very brief. Um, we know that inflation is pretty significant. We know that the cost of goods has gone up and that our labor costs have gone up. So when we have our discussion in January, I would like to have some sort of trend analysis of what um, what the current costs are versus where they were just a few years ago, because we were so excited to see increased bonding uh, at the generosity and the partnership with the county. Uh, but it looks like it's all being eaten up in increased cost.
We'll be able to speak to that. And, and you're right with uh, increased costs. We've done some of that analysis and have noted that uh, we've seen uh, as much as a 30% increase in costs for many of our jobs. And as we think about the overall uh, CIP and the cash flow, uh, we'll have some, some good analogies that we can share. I've been uh, having conversations with a few board members about, uh, and, and I think that as Ms. Keys Gamara talks about making things simple, uh, trying to help our community understand that our CIP and our cash flow is a lot like when you create a budget to do uh, anything that you might do um, within uh, a renovation that you might have in a home that you that you um, own. And so we can use that as, as a bit of an analogy. And so when we think about net zero and increased costs, um, we will be able to bring some items back for the board to consider uh, where those priorities are and how they think the dollars should be directed for uh, particular projects. Great, thank you. Ms. Jarnett Koufax? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fanshawe and Mr. Smith for this presentation. I want to highlight to my colleagues, the staff, and the public an item on page eight that can possibly be repurposed to help our youngest underserved children. We have a bonded property in the Franconia District on the Route 1 corridor that was originally stated to, slated to be an elementary school because of overcrowding in that area. It's referenced as the Pinewood Lakes community and was originally funded by the bond referendum in 2013. But right after that bond approval process for this property, the Department of Defense had a realignment that resulted in over 11,000 jobs being re relocated to Fort Belvoir. And shortly after this, FCPS was able to secure federal grant funding co to construct a new elementary school on the Fort Belvoir base, alleviating the immediate capacity need for the previously bonded school. Dr. Reed, since she has come in, has shared with our board a white paper that Mr. Smith and his team have put together last spring about how we may use this bonded site as a standalone pre-K school and why it would be so impactful to serve as a model for potential other pre-K sites around the country. Study after study have shown that for every dollar we invest in pre-K education, there is a 7 to 13 percent return on investment with the greatest impact being seen with, from our, with our children from disadvantaged backgrounds. Many of us on this board have long lauded the significant impact a quality pre-K program can have on our children um, and our children as they come to kindergarten ready to learn if they have such a program. However, it is most unfortunate that many FCPS children come to our doors without this experience. We have for years worked with the county, the SKIP team, the federal, the state legislators to get the funding needed for slots for our underserved students. Unfortunately, after many, many years, FCPS in Fairfax County are only serving one in six children ages birth to four. I, want, I will once again share this white paper with you. If you can't locate it, I am looking forward to talking about this and talking with you, my colleagues, about this, about accelerating this project as we approach our CIP work session. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin? Uh, uh, Mr. Fanshawe, thank you so much for being here this evening and presenting. Um, and I know it's late, so the only thing I want to just put a fine point on, uh, since I had the pleasure of touring Braddock schools with Dr. Reed and took a very careful note that at every property she was inquiring on what open classrooms might exist and where we might be able to get early childhood uh, education services in them. So um, following along with Ms. Dernak Kovac's comments, uh, I do think that we are really well positioned, especially Dr. Reed with your passion um, and having now been on the skipped committee for, you know, since it's founding seven or eight years ago at this point, um, we, we really need to, I think, get a plan of action in place for that. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I hope Mr. Fanshawe, maybe uh, with some consultation with our FPAC advisory committee, uh, they too, I know, have looked at where we have underutilized space, and and uh, and this might then go to um, again programs. Dr. Reed is identifying sometimes where we have vacancy and where we have need are not always one and the same. But I think that's part of putting together this Rubik's cube 
um, to finally expand and increase um, the, the early childhood education. And I think I sent an email recently about some other school divisions that are, have also been taking some real active steps to, to opening up more of these classrooms for kids. So thank you. Oh, shoot. I did remember one other thing. SAC. School, school age after, or after child care, yeah, school age child care. So that is something pre-pandemic, uh, Mr. Fanshawe, um, I've been working with both um, the former Braddock supervisor and the current Braddock supervisor because we have some very extensive wait lists in the Braddock district and I'm sure throughout the county for many of my colleagues. And I know that the, that the county government um, that runs that program we're understanding the, the critical need that our families have for it. And so I, again, don't know if there's time, but I wanted to put you and Dr. Reed um, and my colleagues aware that if not, I would like to see an intentional meeting set up. We're inviting Chris Leonard, the deputy county executive who used to oversee neighborhood and community services, um, that we really do again, an assessment of what our wait lists look like at each of our SAC sites around the county and how we're gonna help our working families on that one. It, it got unfortunately sidelined due to the pandemic, but here we are and it's another tremendous area of need. And I will say that uh, your predecessor and your seat knew that one of the things we were pushing on is how do we open up um, those classrooms that SAC likes to use for our instruction during the day. So it's kind of a little bit of a quid pro quo. The county wants more SAC space, but then they want to keep those SAC classrooms dedicated and we can't afford to lose instruction space. So I actually think pre-K and SAC could be a really good marriage of using rooms during the day and after school and before school. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move on to agenda item 4.07, fiscal year 23 mid-year budget. I call on Dr. Reed for the introduction. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to introduce uh, Marty Smith again to introduce staff to present the mid-year budget. Thank you, Dr. Reed, and again, uh, good evening, Madam Chair and board. Uh, we are excited to bring our uh, mid-year budget adjustment to the board. Uh, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to our Assistant Superintendent for Financial Services, uh, Lee Bird. Good evening, uh, Chair Sizemore Heiser, School Board members, and Dr. Reed. Uh, the mid-year review offers an opportunity to revise the fiscal 23 budget based on new revenue and unanticipated expenditure adjustments since the year-end budget review in August, and the data is as of October 30th of 2022. On page one, for the school operating fund revenue, there are a couple of changes. Uh, the beginning balance change is due to a sales tax increase um, and a Fairfax City tuition payment increase, totaling $3.3 million, plus an expenditure decrease of one4 for a net change of $4.7 million. The changes are due to fiscal 22 adjustments that occurred after year-end. The other revenue change is for the IDEA grant that resides in the school operating fund and that grant award increased 1.6 million. Also on page one in section two are the recommended expenditure changes which align with the revenue changes. Revenues going up 6.3 million and recommended expenditures are 6.3 million as well, leaving no additional funds available. The IDEA EA grant expenditure changes align with the revenue changes. Both of those are 1.6 million. Uh, in section B, the recommended expenditures include an allocation to the staffing reserve of 2.4 million for 50 positions. Um, the fiscal 23 budget um, included 500 staffing reserve positions, but the staffing reserve is currently depleted. Um, so we'd like to have a little bit of, of flexibility if we have a need arise um, th throughout the rest of the year. The second item is um, the special education compensatory services. Uh, 1.6 million is being set aside to establish the special education compensatory services fund. 
This is just the beginning, of course, and we'll be setting aside other funds as they become available to provide the support needed to ensure students recover from learning loss. Um, item D is the warehouse rack shelving replacement. Funding of a half million is included to support the replacement of the warehouse rack shelving located at the Fort Center. The shelving was inspected this summer and replacement was recommended um, by a third party vendor. Um, th the reason is, is primarily the condition and the age of the shelving. And then the last item that's being recommended is an additional supplement for the Trades for Tomorrow. Uh, funding of uh, 0.1 million is included to provide additional hourly funding for student interns in the Trades for Tomorrow program. Um, this program you know, is a grow your own that offers opportunities to have FCPS students participate as apprentices um, and trade and industrial education opportunities to join the FCPS workforce after graduation. The original plan um, was uh, included in the budget in fiscal 19 and at that time we thought that we would have at least five students but we've been having about 15 students and they actually had this year had um, started turning kids away because they just didn't have the capacity to have more. They didn't have funds in the budget. So we're recommending um, 128,000 be allocated to that program so that all of those students can participate. So the, again, the total expenditure adjustments are 6.3 million in the operating fund. Um, the remaining pages uh, detail changes to the other funds. Um, school construction, um, again, there are expenditure adjustments for projects after the year end that result, result in a de decrease to the beginning balance of 1.3. Um, revenue increased by 2.6 million to recognize um, the city of Fairfax's uh, project for HVAC at Fairfax High School. And also the uh, insurance proceeds from the Woodson fire of 1 million. Uh, transfers from the county incre include uh, county increases include 17 million, uh, 9.5 million of that is for the infrastructure sinking reserve, um, for capital improvement items and stadium restrooms at 7.5 million. Also on page three is food and nutrition services. Again, changes are due to adjustments reported after year end, and they result in a decrease to their reserve of approximately. Uh, 0.6 million plus they got a small grant award for equipment of $11,000. Moving on to the ACE fund on page four, um, there's a slight increase to the beginning balance about $1,000 um, and that too was an adjustment after year end. There is also a decrease of 15,000 in the adult ed and family literacy grant. Um, for a net change to the fund of $14,000. Also on page four are the grants and self-supporting programs. There's a slight change to the fiscal 23 beginning balance due to adjustments after year end of 22,000 and the 10.8 million increase is due to new awards um, or adjustments or increases to um, the current year awards. Details about those um, Awards are also on page four. Um, on page six is the school insurance fund, which is workers' comp and risk management. In this fund, there's 144,000 change in the beginning balance uh, due to year-end adjustments, and there is a corresponding increase to the fund's allocated reserve. And that's followed by the health and flexible benefits fund, a decrease of 1.3 million to the fiscal 23 beginning balance due to adjustments reported after year end. And this change also results in a decrease to the reserve of 1.3 million. On page six is the ERFC fund. The beginning balance reflects a decrease of 27.9 million to the fiscal 23 beginning balance due to adjustments reported after year end. Investment income is down by 51 million, but offset by less fees of 4.8 million for a decrease there. And these changes, a lot of them are due to timing since the final portfolio values are not available when we do year end. Um, 
As a result of these adjustments, the 23 mid-year ending balance is projected to be 3.2 billion, a net decrease of 74 million as compared to the 23 revised budget. And then finally on page seven is the OPEB trust fund. Uh, the beginning balance reflects a decrease of 10.1 million due to a year end adjustment. Um, this too is an annual occurrence due to timing of year end and determining uh, final portfolio values and the adjustment results in a decrease to the projected ending balance to the fund of 10.1 million. Uh, in the appendix, you'll find fund statements for each fund and they reflect all of the changes that I've just shared with you uh, about mid-year. Thank you very much. Ms. Tolan? Yes, I just wanted to remind um, board members that we have this presentation this evening and that we have action on this um, agenda item on January 12th. So we have um, time if people have specific questions on different things that we can, uh, Stella and I can, you know, take care of getting those questions answered for you. Um, I do want to just assure um, the board and uh, the community also, um, we are, had originally a, received a draft of um, this year end um, proposal looking at the staffing reserve the uh, warehouse racks and trades for tomorrow and um, Dr. Reed uh, along with our budget staff did a very very thorough review of you know what was happening across the district and uh, we're very very thoughtful about what we should be doing in this mid-year review and so that is the presentation that you're seeing this evening um, I know there were a lot a lot of internal conversations that happened and I really do appreciate the, you know, start of our fund, um, setting aside some uh, dollars for our um, OCR uh, and recovery that we need to do for our special needs students. Thank you. And again, I remind, remind the board we do are taking action on this on January 12th, as um, our budget chair, Ms. Tolan, said. I see Ms. McLaughlin. Um, yes, just quickly. Uh, Ms. Burden, I wanted to make sure I understood um, the talking points you said about uh, our food nutritional services. So you said there was uh, a $600,000 differential in their reserves. Yes, they had some adjustments that were reported after year end that um, added to the expenditure level, and so that comes out of the reserve when that happens. Okay, so um, we know that it is a self-sustaining fund. Uh, we know that during the pandemic, the reserve was depleted, and then the board needed to provide $10 million due to a lack of a reserve. So what is the status of the reserve now? The reserve currently is uh, very healthy. Um, the state or the federal government requires that we have at least three months of operating expenses in our reserve. And I believe that we have, uh, uh, the reserve that we have currently uh, exceeds that. And we have put together a plan with the state and the federal government as to what, how we will reduce that reserve to get it in line with the three months that they require. So the reserve is in excess of three months and they're not allowed to keep more than a three month reserve. Correct. Okay. So if that's the case, then when the reserve improved, did the $10 million of our operating funds that we gave them then come back? No, it did not. Why is that? Well, we used those funds to provide pay continuity uh, from March of 2020 till the end of the year, end of the fiscal year. Yeah, I, I understand that, but I, I recall that there was board discussion that when you know, we basically lent taxpayer dollars to a self-sustaining fund, and now they've built up their reserves, and 
the $10 million that we took away from the general fund meant it didn't go to uh, our other operating needs because it went to food nutritional services. So now that we, I mean, that's $10 million we could have used for reducing class size, for STEP, for COLA. I mean, so I'm just trying to understand, do we have the legal ability to have them pay back the general fund that the board granted? That is something that we would have to check with them because they are very clear about the funds that are in food services have to be spent on food services. But, I mean, it's, it's worth a conversation because we did do an allocation from the school operating fund to food services. Um, so we'll reach out to the, to the state and see, see if that's something that we can contemplate. Well, to my colleagues at a minimum, I mean, I think that's a really important thing to do because it, it was with consternation that while Loudoun County and Prince William County did not have to give a bailout because they managed their funds in a way that, th that their reserves carried them through the pandemic and we didn't. So $10 million is $10 million that we can still benefit from and I don't want it locked up in FNS. If they've got a reserve now they're trying to spend down I have to say, Dr. Reed, I'll leave it to you and your team to work with Ms. Burden and Mr. Smith, but I mean, the good news is they built back their reserve. Now it turns out they've got more money than they need to do. Meanwhile, I'll end up, because I know people are tired and it's long, but Dr. Reed, this is also really good news that if they can't get the money back, then put it toward getting our salad bars up and running as soon as possible. And, you know, honestly, I think we need to start doing some round tables with our kids and really hearing about what we're hearing from our families. And, you know, I, I appreciate the hard work of our FNS team, but my colleagues, I would encourage you to send your feedback to Dr. Reed and Ms. Burden because I can't be the only board member who's hearing concerns that our food has not recovered to the quality it was before the pandemic. So thank you. I'm sorry for going okay. over. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. I was just going to echo what you said. And I think even in one of the community conversations where I was present, Dr. Reed, people mentioned that I think the, the statement was, when is our food coming back, was, was the statement. So I do agree that I think there's um, some work to be done to um, bring our, our food services back to where they were before. So I appreciate you bringing that up, Ms. McLaughlin. I appreciate that. Um, and with that, I will turn to agenda item five, action items. There's actually no action items on the agenda for this evening. Excuse so, me, Madam Chair, may I be recognized? Yes, Ms. Marin. Yeah, I, so I see that this is the second um, meeting in a row. Um, so now for all the month of December that we've had no action items on the agenda, other than just certifying a closed meeting on December 1. And you know, hearing so many people at the hearing tonight asking for action to vote on collective bargaining, it just seems like a disconnect. So. I'd like to know, uh, can you, um, can the chair clarify what the timeline is for, for action on the collective bargaining? Thank you, Ms. Marin. Well, as you probably know, the board just saw the, res um, just received the resolution, um, the finalized resolution, it, we had a, a closed session on it um, before it came to this public hearing at the, I believe the end of November, I don't have a date in front of me. We have a, um, two closed sessions scheduled in January. There was some follow-up that the board requested that we have closed sessions scheduled in January. We do not have a vote scheduled yet because we want to see what the result of that closed session is as the board processes the work. We had a working group that worked on this resolution for quite a long time, but the board had not seen it, was not part of that working group, as I'm sure you know. And so the two dates of the closed sessions are in chair's notes from last week as well as this week, but there's not a vote scheduled yet as we work through the process with the board. Thank you for the updates. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly, the, I don't believe the public knows about you know those the meeting dates, which will be listed and closed um, as closed meetings. But I also want to express my expectation that, given the lean action agenda items now and into the new year, that we keep our posted schedule for critical topics, especially in February on February 9th with our capital improvement plan, and the school year calendar, and then February 23rd in the advertised budget. And my concern is that. You know, if we're talking now that the collective bargaining vote is going to go into, we're looking at that February time frame, now we have really big things. And I'm just concerned we've had this month of no action. And we've got a lot of action coming at us. And I just hope, 
I am ready to do that work, and I hope the board is ready to stay committed to the schedule that's been put out. I think it's our duty to keep on track. Well, as I'm sure you've seen, there are months where we have more actions, the way the, the ebb and flow of the board work goes, and usually budget and CIP is in January and February, and, and we work on it that through there. The timing of collective bargaining was the timing of when the work group finished its work. So I, well, I do I hope would, I would just like I, to respond, I, I, actually. I it's against Robert's rules to interrupt, so I will give you a chance to, to be recognized. Um, I will say that I, I do hope this board is up for the work, and I believe we are. So Ms. Marin, you can be recognized. Sure, and Robert's rules also prefers to call, not talking to me and you, um, saying you. Um, well, I would like to point out that actually it is not usual to have an entire month of no action items. That is um, not usual. So that's why I'm concerned. So again, I just raise that because we could be headed for a lot of big decisions needing to be made in a very short time, and I just hope we can keep to our schedule. We've had a lot more work sessions scheduled, fewer action items, and now we have a lot of work ahead of us. So I hope that the chair and vice chair will consider that along with the superintendent's planning. Thank you. Agenda item six, consent agenda. Our adopted rules of parliamentary procedure, Robert's rules, provide for a consent agenda listing several items for approval of the board by a single motion. Many items listed have gone through board review and documentation has been provided to all board members and the public in advance. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member prior to the meeting. The consent agenda items are on this screen. Is there any objection to approving the consent agenda? Hearing and seeing no objection, the consent agenda is approved. Agenda item seven, new business. The following are new business agenda items. There will not be a vote on these items this evening, but action is scheduled at a future meeting. The new business items are on the screen. Agenda item eight, board committee reports. Our next agenda item is board committee reports, and I call on first Ms. McLaughlin for an update from the public engagement committee. All right, my colleagues, I'm going to give you a, an early holiday gift and just go super fast because I'd love to go deep in uh, talking about our back-to-back -back, uh, PEC meetings. So anyway, the bottom line is we are looking at um, the fall 2000 or 2022 um, family engagement, uh, our family return to school survey. Um, and just trying to get an understanding of the results from that. And then um, we also will be looking at um, the survey results from ESSER, as well as um, uh, the strategic plan engagement process, project management plan. Um, so we also just talked about in general what happens with our surveys and if it turns out that we have a very small response rate, what is sort of FCPS's directive of what's considered too small of a sample response? Do we then extend the survey to go another one to two weeks with board members being able to um, push that, help the system push it out for our families to get more of that engagement? And not just our families, but in surveys like the calendar where it's the employees as well and students. So. Um, Anyway, it, it ended up being a robust conversation about what are our practices, what are the decision points from our Office of Research and Strategic Innovation, but then also from our Office of um, Communications and Community Engagement. Um, and, and, or, and so anyway, there's just a lot there. And I, I do want to express my appreciation to the, uh, the Public Engagement Committee because um, everyone's been really invested in the work, so thank you. Thank you. I'll call on Ms. Tolan and Ms. McLaughlin for a skipped report. So I'll take that one on. Um, our skip team met last week. We had two presentations, one from the behavioral health team and one from the early childhood team. Both teams were looking for skipped to endorse the plans that they presented. There were considerable comments on the general nature of the behavioral health plan and an ask for more specifics to be added so that clear next steps to develop goals and measures um, would, would be present. Um, I also asked for a focus on workforce development in behavioral health as we move forward. Um, the team is going back to incorporate comments as best they can and the revised plan will be presented to the skipped executive team in January for approval. 
Um, Megan and I are, uh, are on that team along with Sloan Presidio, Francis Ivey, and Michelle Boyd. The early childhood team, including FCPS's Lisa Pilson, presented a plan that focused on outreach strategies to our underserved parents. Lisa is working with a team of research professors at, at Mason University um, for this work. They're planning to develop teams that will reach out and work alongside families to figure out how best to provide early childhood education to that population. Okay. Uh, Mason has done uh, work like this in uh, the city of Alexandria as well. Um, their depth of expertise and passion for this work was palpable and skipped endorsed their plan. Um, the, the work will occur through two new structures, a family council and a family partnership hub. Um, a meeting summary is posted on the county's skipped website and board members, um, you did receive an email today with a summary and all of the materials that are out on that website attached um, to make it easy for you to see um, what happened at the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tolan, and thank you for the written update as well. I'll call on Ms. Keys Gamara for a Comprehensive Planning and Development Committee report. We held a CPDC meeting on December 8th where we were joined by Fairfax County staff for their annual review of major planning uh, and development activities in the county. It was an extremely thorough and helpful presentation to understanding the land use and development process. Our committee recommends that the entire school board be given the opportunity to hear this presentation. We also reviewed the framework for capital project com program community engagement with representatives from OCCR. Staff reported that the framework is currently an internal document that has been published on our website. In our efforts to improve outreach for all land use matters, including CIP, our committee was concerned that this internal document did not adequately notify the community about the potential impact of FCPS development process projects. Uh, Mr. Chuck Fanshaw was in attendance and agreed. A motion was made and accepted that uh, we, the committee asked for a document that specifically addresses when public community public community notice is necessary and what trig triggers the need for that notice for specific development projects that are not currently being addressed. Um, I also attended the Planning Commission Schools Committee meeting last night with Mr. Fanshaw and uh, Mr. Fanshaw did an excellent job in helping to explain where we are in developing um, a document that addresses community engagement. We plan to collaborate with the school's committee and the board of supervisors to make sure that the community is as apprised as soon as possible of any school related development within the community. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call on Ms. Corbett Sanders for a governance committee update. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. The governance committee met yesterday and discussed five transportation related policies, a no change policy on salary guidelines and new policies on school board professional standards and virtual participation. I want to thank Assistant Superintendent of Facilities and Transportation, Mr. Chuck Fanshaw, and the Director of Transportation, Francine Furby, for the, their work to develop these policies. They provided the insights of the transportation staff and how the existing policies can be improved. Policy 8610 is close to completion and the committee has set the next meeting to finalize the policy pending additional input from our alternative programming staff. Consensus on policy 8611, vehicle replacement, and policy 8612 on security, safety, and emergency procedures, security of buildings and grounds, and the no change policy uh, 4610 on salary schedules and guidelines was reached. These policies will be put on new business at the January 12th meeting and ideally opt adopted at the second meeting in January. There was robust conversation about the two new policies. We've set a goal of completing these two policies at the next meeting of the committee. Thank you. And finally, I'll call Ms. Cohen for a report of the audit committee. Our committees have been busy this month. Saving the best committee for last. Um, this month in audit, we first had um, our Auditor General, Esther Coe, um, deliver her FY22 annual report. Um, 
we then had the local school activity fund audit report and the FY22 continuous monitoring Q3 and Q4 results, both um, delivered by Luke Robertson. Um, we then had our ESSER 3 continuous monitoring results um, delivered by Joni White. And um, then finally, um, we covered the FY22 legal audit um, delivered by Ms. Danielle Moore. And just as always, my comments after audit, we just have the most amazing office of the Auditor General team. Uh, everybody just shows up ready to work, and I'm so grateful for our staff who um, interacts with them in such a positive manner. I know um, on the surface it's not the easiest thing to have audit come in um, to your department and say that they want to look at something, and I always appreciate that our staff approaches it with such enthusiasm um, and collaboration. Um, and on this one, certainly want to um, reach out and thank Ms. Burden um, and Mr. Foster um, for, um, for their assistance with these particular audits. Thank you. Agenda item nine, board matters. Next on the agenda is board matters and I call on Ms. Keyes Kamara. Thank you. <clears throat> so it's been a busy month. Um, just this past week, let me see where I, I want to start with the Educate Fairfax update. Um, I think I mentioned, um, well, you guys know I'm the liaison, but there's a project going on right now re related to identified newcomer students in Fairfax County who are supported by the FCPS Homeless Liaison Office, and those numbers of those students continue to grow. Um, these families have difficulty securing essential needs such as clothing, medicine, emergency food, hygiene supplies, etc. So, uh, Educate Fairfax is um, they're donating, they're accepting funds that will be used to purchase gift cards from a variety of stores for the FCPS newcomer families in need to provide for basic or emer emergency purchases throughout the year. Your donation can be made securely online or checks can be mailed directly to Educate Fairfax. The information for both options is available on our website. Last year we collected over $6,800. The deadline to contribute is January 6th. Um, this year I attended, I mean, this year, this month, it does feel like a year, um, attended <laughs> the MSAOC meeting. Um, where we focus a lot on the Parent Advocacy Handbook, um, which has been distributed. Uh, nearly 15,000 hard copies have currently been distributed. Of course, you know about the CPDC meeting. I just mentioned to Educate Fairfax. Um, I also had my Spread the Word Inclusion Virtual Forum. I have to thank Ms. Veronica Jennings of the Special Olympics. She was amazing. She gave us a presentation on how to improve our cultures, but also how to incorporate programs from Special Olympics. And we got, we answered as many questions as we could, but it was a really great um, conversation. And um, I'm just grateful for um, some of the people I've had an opportunity to meet in this journey. Uh, so we had a good time. It was probably part one. We can't cover everything. There's just so much information, but uh, I want to thank Ms. Jennings for um, offering to help and uh, partnering with us. And so we had lots of parents on the line who were saying, how can I bring this? What can PTAs do? How can we participate? So uh, stay tuned. I think we'll see some changes. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Marin. Thank you. Good evening. I think um, I've been doing a lot of listening uh, out in the community as well. I feel like it's in, in the air. Um, I was excited to meet with um, Cornerstones, who I saw a number of events who are present in our community, but just talking really like how do we really help the kids that we see are struggling? How do we take all these resources that we have? And we talked about that here. We have so many, so much information and resources and programs, but, but how are we really identifying those kids that maybe are on the cusp of just succeeding and really get them to where they need to be? So I'm excited to, to do that, um, that work. I also, well, I've been so pleased to see about the science of reading being implemented for our K through second graders. I've been you know, talking with parents similar to me who have a child who struggles with reading from third grade and above, and particularly when it comes to dyslexia. And 
you know, just talking about what parents and families are going through when, when we have students who are beyond that second grade, what's happening in schools, how can we create a better um, process and experience with the IEPs, the individualized education programs. This really comes from what was discussed in our work session, and um, I remember something Laura Jane Cohen said, which was, you know, parents feeling like they need to come into meetings with binders of information, and, you know, I, that very week I went into my own meetings with those binders, but, um, you know, just so I've been thinking, doing a lot of processing around how those connections are made, and um, also just being, you know, school board member, elementary school parent, middle school parent, a lot of things going on connecting, a lot of things I'm seeing that I'm hoping to um, and share, you know, among parents, what they're telling me and texting me this morning, you know, like, well, what period does the middle school start at? And, you know, is there a, an exam today or not? And so in real time seeing, um, and now that I'm in these two schools getting a lot of, of input that I hope is helpful um, to our work and is just helping me see things from the inside. So. Um, those are my reflections, and I hopefully I'll have time to reflect on the year, but happy new year, happy holidays, and we'll just keep going in 2023. Ms. Amesh? Thank you. Uh, I wanna first start by thanking uh, and congratulating Dr. Reed on surviving a half year with us. Um, <laughs> it's uh, you know exciting to uh, think about how much we've been able to do in a short period of time with you. Um, and also, uh, one more time, just congratulating our, our athletes. Really, it, it, with both of those things combined, I was thinking about even early on, you, some of your remarks about how athletics can be used to drive students and how data shows us, right? It increases their motivation, which ultimately improves their academic performance. Um, and especially thinking of that, not only with the young people who showed up today um, uh, and our musicians and everyone who did, but uh, even with watching the World Cup, um, you know, if, if I'm sure as a global, as an increasingly global community, uh, I'd hope that that's something on everyone's radar, but really uh, celebrating history with uh, Africa, uh, making it to the semifinals for the first time uh, was really, really big news. Uh, it was exciting for us in our household and uh, I know for a lot of kids across our county. Um, with that, also want to congratulate every uh, kid who heard back from colleges today. Uh, really big news, obviously, for some of our seniors. Um, and remind everyone uh, who perhaps didn't get the news they were hoping for that hope it, it remains. There's a, another cycle coming up, obviously, and um, we're rooting for you uh, to, to land wherever y your dreams will grow, um, if that's the path for you. Uh, and, and really, it's a celebration of what FCPS is capable of. Uh, you know, I was just talking to my family about kind of my own brother and what's going on, and um, my, uh, the older brother reminded me that uh, this is actually all to credit FCPS. FCPS is what built this. You know, today we celebrated my, uh, our youngest um, going to the college of his dreams or getting accepted, and uh, that started a story in FCPS from my dad who came speaking no word of English, and that's just one example. In FCPS, he grew to become you know, who he is and then raised a family that through FCPS uh, have been able to, um, in our short uh, lives so far, accomplish our goals. So um, I, I really hope to see that you know, for all of our kids, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing to support the academic uh, work, the, the, the great academic work that we do. Um, I also wanted to thank our, our staff for coming out for the public hearing today. I know, you know, we had a we had a tough evening um, in hearing, not no doubt the urgency, which I, I certainly want to continue to push for, uh, but perhaps even some of the the friendly tension that exists in trying to build a path forward uh, uh, for everyone's rights uh, and making sure that uh, for now we have heard all the voices. I, I know I want to certainly do my best to do the right thing. I know that's the commitment of my colleagues and, and we're gonna try our best to navigate that uh, to see how we can do right by everyone. Uh, finally, um, as we enter the holiday season, just you know, health and safety top of mind, especially with obviously the 10th anniversary of Sandy Hook having been just yesterday. Um, but keeping that in mind, I know uh, wishing everyone happy holidays. There are so many to cover, but in any case, uh, and a blessed new year. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Yes, um, at a meeting recently with a McLean Weeblo troop um, to talk about local government, we were talking about how important hiring a superintendent is. And so I want to um, echo what you, what you just said. I, I was thinking about as we close out this calendar year of 2022, um, I want to note that Dr. Reed has now been with us for six months. 
Um, during this time, she has held meetings in every pyramid, been to countless sporting events, parades, classroom presentations, and has on top of that, had time to spearhead a new strategic planning process, begin a new budget cycle, and get to know our legislative priorities. Um, she hired an interim assistant superintendent of facilities, blogs to the community every week about the amazing adventures she has had across FCPS, and keeps the board informed of issues like I have never been informed before. Dr. Reed, thank you for a very busy whirlwind of six months. I wish for you the same wish I have for all of my Drainsville students, staff, and families. A wonderful holiday season filled with fun, food, and drink, and time with your loved ones. After a busy few weeks at school and community events, I'm closing out this year at Churchill Road tomorrow to see the STEAM card provided um, through an Educate Fairfax teacher grant to kindergarten teacher Ms. Clark and to practice yoga with students and their social worker, Mr. Smith. Happy holidays to everyone. Please everyone get some rest. The whirlwind will pick right back up when we get back in January. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. It's been an amazing couple of weeks. Last week I was happy to join Dr. Reed and Vice Chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and a fellow Notre Dame alum. Uh, Chris Grady at Walt Whitman Middle School where students solved a STEAM challenge in which the students in Mr. Shabazz's eighth grade engineering two class uh, demonstrated their solutions to a problem that the Admiral had presented to them the week before. It was wonderful to be at Fort Belvoir for their holiday celebration as well as uh, join with Chief Bailey in his toy distribution to students in, the, in need on the Route 1 corridor, uh, as well as the safety and security discussion at Mount Vernon High School where my colleague, Ms. Darnak Kofax, joined me. I look forward to joining Dr. Reed next week in meeting with the historians and educators of Arlington National Cemetery. I know their work is especially important to the 14,500 military connected students in this county. Uh, Chair Sizemore Heiser and I attended the county's legislative briefing on Tuesday. We appreciate the County Board of Supervisors' inclusion of our school board priorities and their legislative priorities as well. Of particular note is the recognition by the County Board and the Fairfax delegation of the needs of additional supports for our students in crises, in particular the need for inpatient beds for students uh, who may be addicted to opioids. Mr. Malloy and I will be working with Chair Sizemore Heiser in preparing remarks for the Fairfax delegation public hearing on January 7th. I also want to give a shout out and warm wishes for a wonderful retirement to Mr. Eugene Jordan, whom retired last week from Mount Vernon High School after 54 years of teaching chemistry, wow. 19 of which were at Mount Vernon High School. I know, a man after your own heart, right, Dr. Reed? <laughs> I want to conclude by thanking George Mason's Shar School of Public Policy and Dean Roselle. I was honored to be recognized along with Alexandria's Mayor Justin Wilson, Delegate Ken Plum, and the retiring Executive Director of the Council of Governments, Chuck Bean, last week at their regional elected leaders' dinner. And happy holidays to everybody. I wish you uh, joy and prosperity and love with your loved ones, not only in the uh, couple of weeks of the holiday, but all next year. Thank you. Ms. Bukarski? Oh, okay, I didn't expect that, but okay. I'm mixing it up today. I jumped to the front of that line, okay. <laughs> um, well, it's been a, an extremely busy last couple of weeks. Um, I've had the pleasure of going to multiple holiday concerts, string, choir, band, um, and every, you know, everything, and it has been wonderful to see the, um, the students perform and their wonderful talents. I also had the opportunity to go to Chantilly High School with um, our Real Food for Kids Challenge winners from Fl Franklin Middle School um, where Chantilly uh, 
was able to actually cook and serve the winning dish to their high schoolers. So that was, yeah, that was very exciting for the middle schoolers to just kind of see all their hard work and creativity kind of come to fruition and actually be the nutritious meal that is being served in our cafeteria. So I'm excited for a lot more, um, you know, I in terms of our food services and um, nutrition, and I know that's something that Dr. Reed, you've been working on, and I am very excited to see more changes there. Um, I had the opportunity to go to a few schools as well. Um, I visited Center Ridge, uh, where I got to see um, this incredible reading room that a few teachers had just volunteered and had completely transformed um, to make it much easier for other teachers to go in there and really pick what they wanted by genre and um, so on and so forth. So that was incredible and it was all volunteer time. Um, I was able to go to Key Center in Ms. Dernak Koufax's district to learn a little bit more about that program um, and got to attend a music therapy class, which was really a treat to see. Um, I was also at Oak Hill and at Westfield with, doc with Delegate Shin um, from the House of Delegates, and I just had the opportunity to show her all the wonderful things that are happening in our schools and ways that we can partner with our state um, officials uh, to really help and benefit our schools because there is a lot that we do here, but there is a lot that can be done at the state level to help with our work that is needed. And um, at Oak Hill, I had the opportunity actually to go into a professional development workshop during the day where a master teacher was actually modeling um, reading and uh, to to other teachers they were taking notes and then they would get to practice their skills and then there would be a debrief which really was you know a wonderful way to build in that happy holidays everyone I can't believe I ran out of time uh, and happy new year I'm excited to see all of you in the new year Ms. Cohen Thank you. Uh, I got to start off the last couple of weeks by going out to visit Cedar Lane and then went today um, to go back for their winter concert and the kids were amazing. Students, I shouldn't say kids, young adults. Um, they were amazing. It was so, it was just great. Uh, really incredibly talented kids. I also got to be a guest reader at Oak View's book fair um, and that was super fun. By the way, there's a new um, Don't Let the Pigeon book um, out for everybody wondering what I want on my holiday wish list. Um, also got a chance to go to the Google Reston site um, where Ms. Merritt and I got to see um, our very own Joyce Matthews, uh, heralded for all that she has done to promote computer science education in FCPS and beyond, and it was just awesome to get to see um, her celebrated in the manner in which she should be celebrated. Um, also had the opportunity to take Dr. Reed, though apparently she won't claim it, to Waples Mill Elementary um, with also with Ms. Pekarski and then at, and we went to Franklin Middle School where in a very timely nature we got to be a part of the unskilled workers and the skilled workers who were trying part of Newsies who were trying to convince the unskilled laborers to come and join their union so we had a preview already to what was going to happen tonight. Um, also had the chance to go see the award-winning Lake Braddock Symphonic Band, who we got to recognize tonight, um, and who has my very favorite trumpet player in it, um, at their winter concert, which was amazing. And then chorus, um, Lake Braddock chorus, with um, my other favorite cutie, uh, got to have their winter concert, which was amazing. It was a masterwork, and it was just, it was really, really cool. Um, and then had the opportunity to be with Ms. Omesh, part of the faith team, um, strategic planning faith team, and that was such a cool experience, and we really, I know, are both looking forward to uh, the next meeting in March. Um, and then sort of closing the week, um, we recognized this year, uh, yesterday, the 10-year anniversary of Sandy Hook um, with a vigil outside of the NRA um, and I had the opportunity to be joined by Ms. Pekarski, 
um, and Mr. Frisch and a whole lot of our gun violence prevention advocates, including a lot of my fellow Moms Demand volunteers, um, for a very somber but also hopeful um, and very action-oriented morning of um, just fellowship and, and being together and um, turning that grief into action. And it was just such a reminder of um, how fortunate we all are to be able to spend this holiday season um, with our own kiddos. And um, I hope that everybody will have some meaningful time and peaceful time. Thanks very much. Mr. Frisch. Thank you. Um, earlier this week, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Delegate Marcus Simon and I visited Shrevewood Elementary School a little late, but this was the uh, culmination of our Take Your Legislator to School Month tradition. Uh, since it was Spirit Week, we donned uh, crazy socks in celebration of the coming uh, winter break. We toured the building, uh, visited classrooms, spoke to students and staff. We also spoke with Principal DeSmyder about the implementation of our uh, science of reading-based literacy curriculum, as well as social-emotional learning and staffing issues. On Tuesday evening, I attended Oakton High School's Winter Choral Concert. Uh, from modern a cappella songs to Hanukkah, Christmas, and other winter classics, the students put on a marvelous show. I'd like to send a special congratulations to Oakton's choral director, DJ Godinez. Uh, the hard work certainly paid off. Uh, with winter weather coming in full force, many people are pulling out their winter coats. The Office of Supervisor Dalia Palchik is in partnership with the Providence Community Center and other groups in hosting a coat drive beginning next week and continuing until January 19th. If you have any new or gently used winter coats, hats, or gloves, you can drop them off at Providence Community Center. One last note, as Ms. Cohen mentioned, yesterday we joined dozens of friends and neighbors at a vigil in remembrance of the 26 students and educators who lost their lives to gun violence at Sandy Hook on December 12, uh, 2020, 2012. Um, since that day 10 years ago, 279 additional victims of 189 school shootings have uh, lost their lives uh, across the country. Um, here in Fairfax County, we're doing everything we can to keep our students and staff safe from building security vestibules uh, on every campus and conducting a comprehensive safety audit to reviewing our curriculum and professional development um, from informing parents annually about their legal responsibility to securely store their guns uh, to closing the gun ban loophole that for decades barred guns on school grounds, but not on school property that didn't include education facilities like Gatehouse. Um, so we're doing everything we can to keep our, our kids safe. Um, and with that, to my colleagues, uh, the superintendent, our staff, our students, uh, and other families, I hope everyone has a safe, uh, healthy, and restful winter break. Happy holidays to anyone who is celebrating. Thank you. Dr. Anderson? Thank you. Earlier this month, I had the pleasure of attending Kick It Up Night, um, which was a staff versus student soccer event at Glasgow Middle School. It was timely given the events of the World Cup. And yes, lots of people in my home were rooting for Morocco. I also had a chance to attend some terrific theater programs in the Mason District. I was here um, to see the Brothers Grimm Spectacular-thon here at Jackson Middle School. And last week, actually after the kick-a-thon, went to Falls Church High School for their production of Chicago, which was amazing. It was so awesome. I was very excited to just hear their talent. They were just phenomenal. Um, last week, I also had the opportunity to visit Falls Church High School with Congressman Donald Beyer. Um, we had a great conversation with the student government class, and it w they were so impressive. They had such thoughtful questions regarding school funding, um, green initiatives, um, supports for English language learners. Um, I, I think he got more than he bargained for with that group. And, and also mental health, of course. Um, we also had a chance to see the construction and progress in very excited that some walls are coming up outside. There's some foundations that are happening, but it's a huge effort and looking forward to seeing more and more of that building be completed. 
um, also had a chance to see a door decorating contest that was in progress at Falls Church High School. As a former you know, school principal, this is something that I've missed. I don't get a chance to see some of those events in the building. So thank you, Dr. Nowak, and all the students and staff at Falls Church. Um, I was very pleased today. I want to say thank you to all of the folks who came to speak um, before us for the collective bargaining public hearing. And I, I know there was some tension, as Ms. Um, Ome shared, but we're looking forward to working those out for the benefits of our um, of our community. I do want to start to highlight to the Mason community that the strategic planning forums, um, which are being scheduled in each magisterial district, um, the Mason meeting is February 2nd at 6.30, which will be taking place at Mason Crest Elementary School, not only one of the schools that has geothermal, but also will be the next recipient in lines for um, solar panels. So yay, Mason. And I'm also a proud parent of the Mason Crest Elementary School type, um, Tigers. Um, tomorrow, I will be at Poe Middle School in the morning for their winter holiday concert by their various performing arts groups. I do want to give a shout out to um, a recipient of the 2022 Governor's Award on Volunteerism and Community Service, Ortho Virginia, ha that has been supporting schools and FCPS for over 40 years. They've, pro they've been providing serv medical services to our school athletic teams, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Ellenberger, the retired um, Director of Student Activities, for submitting that. I wish everyone a very restful and joyous winter break and a happy new year. Ms. McLaughlin. Great, um, Dr. Reed, I wanna begin by expressing my appreciation to your region teams. Um, this week I had updates with region two, region four and region five. And uh, it's not easy when there are so many board members and yet they have continued to carve out generous amounts of time to meet with us as board members, give us these monthly updates. And uh, all three of them, I conveyed how much I appreciate the fact that as our society is still trying to recover from the pandemic, uh, this is hard work. And our families are, are still trying to heal, their children are still trying to heal. And the amount of compassion that I'm continuing to see in my interactions with the region office as they take the cases that come to me as a board member. Um, I really wanted them to know that it's appreciated and I wanted you to know how hard they're working um, to do that each and every day. Um, and I, you know, I do want to convey to you and your leadership team in general, um, I know I am uh, have a reputation for sometimes asking tough questions. Um, and uh, sometimes I don't smile enough while I'm doing it. So I do want to make sure, again, you and everyone's here, especially late this evening, um, you, every one of you, I know the deep dedication you bring to this work every day. And um, I, I wanted to express my personal appreciation that uh, you all do work extremely hard, often behind the scenes. People don't realize all that you're doing to support Dr. Reed and us on the board level. And so uh, even though I will continue to do better in the new year as I um, raise my questions to you, I do hope you know it comes from a, a place of camaraderie in that I know every one of us cares about this system, our employees, our kids, our families. And uh, so finally, I do wanna say, to my colleagues, I wish you all a wonderful happy holidays. And to all of our families, uh, please know that you, as well as our employees, especially in our schools, uh, we appreciate everything you're doing every day to help our kids find joy in learning and, and being able to find and achieve um, their best uh, and brightest futures. And uh, I hope that, that we can find time over this winter break to uh, really enjoy that time with our loved ones and come back excited for uh, 2023. It's hard to believe. Thanks again, you guys. Ms. Jarenak Koufax. Thank you. Since I am uh, Ms. Sizemore Heiser and I are the last two um, sitting between your cup of cocoa and, uh, and, your, and your winter break a little bit, 
Oh, or other things maybe. I'm looking at some folks over there that may be having it. But, but anyway, um, I do want to say I thank you so much for um, your hard work this past calendar year. We really do appreciate you and everything that you do to make our board the very best that we can be. And we know sometimes um, we don't make that easy. But uh, we hope during this coming year um, we will um, work together and we will continue to have a strategic focus as we move forward in our work processes. And um, I wish you and my colleagues um, and all the families and teachers and everyone out there a uh, warm and wonderful holiday season. Take time to relax and enjoy time with those you love most. So happy holidays and happy new year. Thank you. And since I'm the last one standing between you and your bed, I will just say that um, as someone whose um, family moved here and didn't have a tradition of celebrating Christmas or winter holidays, um, for our family the big holiday was Diwali in October, but as a child growing up here, I loved Christmas time and the holidays. I loved all of it, and I, it took me a long time to realize why I loved all of it, and it's because no matter how divided or frustrated or tense things were, you walked around and there was decorations that weren't there a month before and there was happy music that drove you nuts at times but that wasn't there the month before and there was just sort of this aura of joy in the air and so I hope you all for all your hard work and all that we've caused you frustrations and all the efforts and, and that you put into and how difficult it has been um, this year take some of that joy that's just in the air and feel it so happy holidays this meeting's adjourned <laughs>